I'm calling to order this uh, meeting. This is an additional meeting of the Committee of the Whole. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Wednesday, May 28, 2014. We are in uh, room 500, the Council Chambers of the Johnny Wilson Building. The time is 12.57 in the afternoon. And uh, the first item of business is determination of a quorum with the uh, Committee Clerk call the roll. Chairman Mendelson. Present. Councilmember Alexander. Here. Councilmember Barry. Councilmember Barry. Councilmember Bonds. Here. Councilmember Bowser. Here. Councilmember Catania. Here. Councilmember Che. Here. Councilmember Evans. Here. Councilmember Graham. Here. Councilmember Grosso. Here. Councilmember McDuffie. Here. Councilmember Orange. Here. Councilmember Wells. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cash. Uh, we have two items on the agenda for the Committee of the Whole. The first is markup of Bill 20-749, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act of 2014. Mm -hmm. And the second is Bill 20-750, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act of 2014. Members know this, but I will save this for the benefit of the public. These are companion pieces. The uh, Budget Request Act, or BRA, is the budget that for the District of Columbia for the fiscal year that begins October 1st of this year. Uh, because uh, we are still under, uh, and this is actually a ruling of the court, under the old process where Congress must appropriate our budget, we adopt the Budget Request Act on a single reading. So it is before us today, and after we have voted on it, it we are done with it. It is disposed of and it's transmitted to Congress. And they have to affirmatively act on our Budget Request Act. The Budget Support Act, which accompanies our Budget Request Act every year, is like a normal, ordinary bill, a piece of permanent law, and uh, it's treated like any other bill that we pass. So it goes through two readings. The first reading is today, and the second reading is scheduled for two weeks from today. That is June 11th. I believe that's a Wednesday. Uh, both of these uh, bills have a, a report that members have, uh, and as well as the uh, draft print, which rep rep represents the print represents my recommendation to the members of the council. The report and print for each bill largely reflects the recommendations of the committees of the council, which have held hearings since April 3rd, since the April 3rd submission of the budget and which marked up their recommendations a couple of weeks ago. And of course, there was a fair amount of attention by the public to the acts of the different committees, uh, because that's given a lot of weight in this process. And as I said, the prints that I uh, have put before members today reflect, I would say, 99% of the recommendations of the committees. Uh, I'm going to speak very generally about the budget overall that uh, uh, we have before us today. And the first item I want to speak to is the uh, tax, um, the proposal to uh, make revisions to our uh, tax structure in the District of Columbia. Uh, and I am, uh, for benefit of members, I'm generally going in the order of the, um, the report, the first uh, 30 pages of the report, which provide a summary. And I do want to thank the staff of the budget office, our budget office, for the work they did on this report, which I've received a number of compliments from members. The Tax Revision Commission, which was established by this council several years ago, um, met for over a year and made a number of recommendations which it issued last December. The commission found that low and middle income residents pay a disproportionately higher share of their income in district taxes. Uh, additionally, the Commission found that the district's business income taxes are the highest in the region and among the highest in the nation. The proposal that I'm putting forward uh, phases in the recommendations of the tax revision, tax revision Commission over five years, with all of the tax relief fully funded and implemented by tax year 2019, although I have to note to members that a discussion with the Chief Financial Officer this morning indicates uh, he may have some concerns which would require our having to um, 
implement a trigger mechanism in the out years with regard to the um, these tax revisions, but that is not before us today. The proposal funds the majority of the Commission's proposals with special focus on providing immediate relief for low and moderate income residents. Full implementation of the entire plan will cost $165 million a year. The Council's plan adds considerable progressivity to the district's individual income tax structure and reduces the effective rate for all district taxpayers. Uh, this is an average from 4.9% to 4.5%. That is the average effective tax rate. In order to help district businesses compete and thrive in a region with very porous borders, the Commission recommended, and in this proposal, we would be implementing a reduction of the incorporated and unincorporated business franchise tax to 8.25% over the five years. That would be the same rate as Maryland's and competitive with Virginia's 6% rate. The rate would be reduced in phases and will reach 8.25% by tax year 2019. In addition, the proposal um, with regard to the estate tax uh, phases in conformity with the federal tax code. Uh, the, uh, this is the exemption threshold, which right now is a million dollars, would be doubled to two million dollars, I believe, in tax year 2016, and then reach the federal threshold of 5.25 million uh, by tax year 2018. I do want to note that there were documents circulated last night to members that suggested that we're increasing the general sales tax. That is not in the proposal before us today. The, um, the proposal that's before us uh, plans to adjust the PAYGO transfer uh, from a fixed to a floating base year. This is a mechanism that the Council adopted uh, several years ago to try to increase um, what we call PAYGO, which is current year revenues for capital spending and thereby reduce the amount of borrowing that we do. And the, um, the fiscal year 2000, in fiscal year 2016, the district is scheduled to implement a PAYGO provision whereby each year 25% of the increase in the district's revenues over fiscal year 2015 levels will be dedicated, um, will be dedicated to the PAYGO uh, will be dedicated to PAYGO. Uh, what we're doing with the proposal before us today is instead to implement this provision starting in fiscal year 2017 and to modify the proposed calculation so that the 25% of the increase in the district revenues is over the previous year rather than over fiscal year 2015. While Members and the Council historically has agreed with the importance of employing PAYGO to decrease the district's reliance on borrowed capital. It must be sustainable and not foreclose future growth. Without this proposed change, by 2018 the operating funds required to be set aside for PAYGO would roughly equal the district's annual revenue growth, and by 2020 the PAYGO dedication would be more than double the district's annual revenue growth. That is simply not sustainable. In order to improve budget transparency, there is also in the uh, Budget Request Act a request that Congress enact into law the Contingency Cash Reserve Transparency Amendment Act of 2008. This was legislation that this Council adopted six years ago. This legislation, which was introduced by then Chairman Gray and unanimously adopted by the Council, would impose more meaningful guide rails on the use of the Contingency Cash, cash Reserve Fund. The Contingency Fund is one of two funds established in the Home Rule Act to provide reserves for urgent, unexpected funding needs, such as those that might uh, follow a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. In fiscal year 2014, the district made good use of the Contingency Fund to keep the government running while, the federal, while federal gridlock resulted in a lapse of appropriations. However, the Contingency Fund has increasingly been tapped to fund expenditures that do not appear to meet the spirit of the law. In recent years, the fund has been used 
to pay for a broad range of expenses such as providing new super cans, uh, funeral subsidies, painting privately owned taxi cabs, etc. There exists a structural flaw regarding the contingency fund wherein the mayor may spend funds for any, quote, non-recurring or unforeseen, unquote, use without any legislative check on that expense. And then we are required to repay that draw from the contingency fund in the following two years. Um, as I said, the Budget Request Act contains language to approve the legislation that we had adopted in 2008 to tighten up controls over spending from the contingency fund. I should also note that in the Budget Request Act, there is language, as has been the case every year, and I believe is recommended by the mayor this year, with regard to affirmatively ratifying budget autonomy so that we uh, do not foreclose that option while we continue to pursue the litigation. The Capital Policy and Reserve Account Amendment Act of 2014, which is a subtitle in the Budget Support Act, requires the Chief Financial Officer to prepare a 15-year capital replacement schedule that defines the major assets and repairs that need to be done during the next 15 years when those major renovations and replacements, when those major renovations and replacements need to occur and how much they will cost. This subtitle also requires that any unspent debt service be used as pay-go Uh, the Council believes strongly in funding important and effective programs that address basic human needs. Thus, uh, what is before us today with the Budget Request Act and the Budget Support Act addresses key threats to the well-being of district residents, including the ongoing family homelessness and affordable housing crises, the crippling effect of chronic diseases, and the health and mental needs of district youth. In the area of human services, uh, what's before us is investing significant resources in programs proven effective in responding to both individual and family homelessness. Council-wide actions that are in the uh, materials before us today include enhanced funding for the local rent supplement program, uh, an SS, that's Social Security um, Disability Income Outreach Access and Recovery Program to provide application assistance for those applying for SSI. A Homeless Prevention Program Establishment Act of 2014, which is based on a successful New York City program that works with families to help them stay in their homes and not become homeless. Uh, family case managers specifically for uh, the DC General, where families are currently being housed, and a coordinated entry system for homeless individuals. Uh, taken together, this is intended to bring a little bit more, uh, what do I want to say, uh, coherence to our homeless intake and prevention efforts to try to reduce homelessness. Since taking control of the operations of the United Medical Center in 2010, the district has invested millions of dollars to improve operations and services. Although progress has been made in improving hospital operations, the district remains committed to moving control of the hospital to a private partner. Therefore, the Council supported the Mayor's $12.7 million contract with Huron to develop and implement a turnaround plan for UMC, that's the United Medical Center. Although the plan discusses building a new facility, it specifically details capital improvements at the current hospital in both facilities, equipment, uh, information, technology, as well as routine and deferred maintenance over the next four to five years at a cost of $155 million. Well below the executive's projected $335 million cost of a new facility. The strategic vision makes it clear that, quote, prompt district action is required to make UMC attractive to a partner, uh, but the district should defer substantial strategic facility and equipment investment prior to securing a partner, unquote. This is why the proposal before us is following the advice of the higher turnaround consultants and fully funding the capital investments necessary to improve the current UMC facility, attract an operating partner, rebrand the UMC, encourage more residents to utilize the facilities, services, and improve patient services. And in this regard, in short, for members, uh, we are uh, sustaining or in this document is the recommendations from the Health Committee, and I want to thank Councilmember Alexander for her work on this. This year, the mayor proposed an $884 million six-year capital budget for the 8th Street Benning K Street streetcar project and federal streetcars 
project. The budget is $523 million more than what was proposed for fiscal years 2014-2019 and easily dwarfs that of any other project in the capital improvement plan. As much as $740 million of project funding would be diverted from future operating budgets. The funding mechanism proposed for the project would divert as much as $3 billion, an average of $300 million per year, from the operating budget over the next 10 years for the streetcar and circulator systems. The budget before us today would maintain a six-year $400 million investment in streetcar capital projects, federal and local funds, consistent with what uh, we had uh, um, approved only a year ago, and give priority to the 8th Street line. I want to repeat that. Give priority to the 8th Street line. Dedicate 45 to $65 million of operating funds to the projects annually, and supplement the dedicated funding stream with other PAYGO or GOIT bond financing as needed. This amount of funding is consistent with annual budget allotments that the project has received in recent years and exceeds, I want to repeat that, and exceeds DDOT's annual spending on streetcar projects to date. Uh, as DDOT's chief engineers indicated, streetcar tracks on the 8th Street Bridge over the Amtrak rail lines are temporary because of the bridge must be replaced within the next three to five years. Therefore, also in the budget before us is adding $170 million of funding to the 8th Street Benning K Street Line project to be used as a local match for full replacement of that bridge over the next three years. The council directs the mayor to amend the Regional Transportation Improvement Program to include full replacement of the bridge so that federal financial assistance can be made available for full replacement of the bridge by fiscal year 2018. And this is important in order for the 8th Street line to be able to expand. While balanced in fiscal year 2015, there is a sizable gap between revenues and expenditures in the out years of the financial plan starting in fiscal year 2016. This gap was caused by two main factors. First, the use of $68.8 million in one-time resources to fund programs with an ongoing impact on the budget. And second, a projected increase in the debt service of 93, almost $94 million. The mayor's budget estimates that this $166 million, let me repeat that, the mayor's budget estimates that this $166 million gap represents approximately 8% of non-personal services expenses excluding those associated with Medicaid, schools, retirement, and debt service. In order to monitor the resolution of the potential imbalances in the financial plan, we are passing, as part of the Budget Support Act, the Financial Reporting Act of 2014. This subtitle mandates that the Office of the Chief Financial Officer report to the Council on a quarterly basis the progress made toward resolving the potential fiscal year 2016 gap. Finally, the uh, mayor's proposed revised revenue estimate contingency priority list is struck from the budget advanced by the council. This list, since it is based on contingent revenue increases, gives an unrealistic expectation that an item on the list will be funded in the coming fiscal year. Uh, we believe that the better avenue for expenditures of increased revenues is through the supplemental budget process, which is how the district has made such determinations for decades. Nevertheless, to meet unmet needs, uh, there is provided in the Budget Request Act authority to expend up to $50 million of additional FY 2015 revenues in the BRA. The Council will collectively determine the priorities that should be funded in a new subtitle at the second reading of the Budget Support Act. Uh, that was long and probably does not cover everything that are in the uh, budget documents before us. I will now move for consideration the committee print of Bill 20-749, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Request Act of 2014. Discussion. Oh. Councilmember Che. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and first, let me uh, commend you and your staff uh, on an excellent, uh, progressive, thoughtful, and uh, balanced council budget and the memorandum that you sent around. And I'm particularly pleased with the uh, recommendations that uh, you've made with respect to endorsing the uh, bulk of the recommendations from the Tax Revision Commission, and I very much support that proposal. The issue I want to bring up now, however, uh, is the matter of the streetcar. And I want to say uh, thank you for your explanation about how we're going forward on that. And I do agree that we had to put that on 
a better footing in terms of funding. It, it simply wasn't sustainable what we had had previously. Uh, but what I want to do is I, I want to get out on the record that this in no way uh, diminishes our commitment to the streetcar. And I wanted to, to ask you to, to speak to that a little bit because I think that this is a, an extraordinarily important economic development tool and a transit tool, both things at the same time. So um, could I get your um, commitment today that what we're doing with the streetcar reflects both a better way of sustaining it as a financial matter, reflects also the reality of how the streetcar has unfolded, which is to say it has been uh, delayed and, to my mind, significantly mismanaged, and the funding that we have given hasn't been used. But assuming we can get our house in order and we go forward, I would like to hear what you have to say about what we're doing today and the commitment to the streetcar overall. Sure, Councilman Berche. Um, first of all, I, I do not think that the action before us at all today does anything except support continuation of the streetcar program. The, uh, what we have in the capital improvement plan over the next five years is uh, actually more than 500 million when you include, in fact, I think it's close to 600 million when you include the 8th Street Bridge, which is integral to any possible expansion of the 8th Street line westward and also very much relates to what I would hope would eventually be a connection to Union Station uh, from the street with the streetcar. Um, I, I think that there has been a lack of adequate focus on 8th Street, which is why we have seen continual delays in 8th Street. And actually what we have before us is to uh, try to, and to the best we can, impress on the executive uh, a that they need to focus on completing 8th Street. You and I, Councilman Roche, have talked about the uh, larger scope of the streetcar program, and that larger scope is retained in the, uh, the description, the scope of the capital improvement plan project. So that is there. The dollars that some folks, including the mayor, have focused on being uh, reduced are dollars in the out years. And when I say that, I'm talking about 2019-2020. And uh, that is in legislative terms and in budgeting terms light years away from today. And there are so many opportunities for us to increase the funding. But I believe your committee noted that they're not even spending the dollars that are being made available to them now, and uh, they actually have more dollars available for them next year because of the unspent dollars this year that will carry forward. So uh, the short-term needs of 8th Street, which if I remember correctly, are somewhere around 30 or $40 million, are more than met with the $587 million. Um, and we're actually providing additional dollars for the, with, with regard to the 8th Street Bridge so that that necessary component gets done. I think we're doing everything to support this except banking money in 2019 and 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Bergrasso. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Once again, I want to acknowledge and thank you and your staff and the Budget Office staff for all the hard work that you've put into another thoughtful budget and committee report. Budgets are always about competing priorities, and I am pleased to support a lot of what we have in front of us today. I wanted to take the opportunity to highlight a couple of the things, on, including tax relief, education, workforce development, and transportation. From the very beginning, I supported the diligent work of the Tax Revision Commission because I felt it was necessary to take a comprehensive look at our tax policy rather than a piecemeal approach. I'm pleased today that we are poised to pass one of the largest tax relief packages for middle class individuals and families in the district's history. I want to be clear, while there are some things that I certainly support, including adding a new individual income middle bracket of 40 to 60,000 at 7 percent in FY15 and later 6.5 percent in FY16, expanding the earned income tax credit to childless workers and reducing the unincorporated and incorporated business franchise taxes, there are other things included in this tax relief package that we could have done without. For example, I do not agree with raising the threshold for estate taxes. But I understand that policy is often about compromise, and so I'm pleased to support the proposal we have before us today. Improving public education has been a priority of mine since I first joined the Council. I support the work of the Committee on Education in the FY15 budget, and I'm especially pleased to support the following enhancements. A provision requiring D.C. public schools to report on its implementation of a restorative justice pilot program next school year. As many of you know, I'm committed to pushing our education sector to 
sector to examine school discipline policies in an effort to end the school to prison pipeline. $1 million for the continuation of the Community Schools Grants Program, which works to integrate academics, health and social services, youth and community development, and community engagement in our public schools, and enhance funding to provide additional collections for the new library at the D.C. Jail. I also support the Committee on Education's decision to amend the capital improvement plan to align capital funding with those schools that need it most. I'm especially pleased that this budget begins to force coordination and integration among our government agencies. I attended every budget hearing for the committees on which I am a member, and I can say with certainty that we are at a turning point in our city. Officials, educators, and advocates are starting to work together to address how we are failing district residents, particularly when it comes to workforce development. I work closely with the Committee on Economic Development to include, in their, to include in their final committee budget report an additional staff member at the Workforce Investment Council. This $175,000 is allocated for a new employee at the WIC and a technical consultant to conduct a cross-agency study that will track how each agency allocates their adult literacy and workforce development funding. I also strongly support the Committee of the Whole, including specific policy recommendations and expectations in the committee print that the University of District of Columbia flagship campus allocates the entire $2.5 million enhancement for the University of the District of Columbia Community College Workforce Development and Lifelong Learning Program in addition to its existing budget and resources. Mr. Chairman, I just have a little bit more to go here if you don't Without mind. Without objection. This means the, committee, the community college's workforce development programs will receive $5.5 million this year. We spend much of our time and energy focusing on ways to support working and needy families in the district. An unrecognized part of our supporting our residents is allowing mothers and fathers to take care of a newborn, a sick child, or relative in their home. I am proud of what Councilmember McDuffie, the Committee on Government Operations, and I are accomplishing by presenting authorizing language for all district government employees to take up to eight weeks of paid family leave. Finally, I would like to express my support for the Council maintaining the full funding planned six-year, $400 million investment in the Street Guard Project with 45 to $65 million of operating funds dedicated to the project annually. This amount of funding is consistent with annual budget allotments that the project has received over the past seven years and exceeds what DDOT has been able to spend. I also appreciate that we've included $187 million towards the 8th Street Bridge, a critical infrastructure project needed for the completion of the streetcar line. There are so many other things I could talk about, like the funding for the Therapeutic Recreation Center in Ward 7, the funding for the Humane Society, the strategic plan for the United Medical Center, the SNAP benefit enhancements, the investments in homeless and human service coordination, and the expansion of the school-based mental health program. But as you know, I'm already out of time. Overall, I think this is a strong budget, and I'm pleased to vote in favor of it today. I do have an amendment for the budget that's uh, fairly straightforward. Are we supposed to offer those now? Uh, if it's concerning the Budget Request Act, you may. Uh, no, this is for the Budget Support Act. All right. You have to uh, wait till we get to that, please. Councilmember Bowser. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am waiting on a, a fist to come in, so I can can I go and later? Uh, I don't believe there's anybody else in the lineup. Okay. May I offer this and have the? Yes. Is the oh. is it come is the fist coming in quickly? Back. I think Tommy is. I have amendments waiting. For this. Okay. Um, why don't you circulate and, okay. uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Wells. While that's circulating, may I make a comment? Uh, is that all right, Councilmember Bowser? Okay. Councilmember Bowser, is that okay? Mr. Wells wanted to make sorry, a Mr. Wells asked to make a comment while that's circulating. Sure. Mr. Wells. Well, I just wanted to say that um, I I don't think that the way the investment in the streetcar is being portrayed exactly. In the way that certainly that the mayor sees it, that according to the mayor, the council cut 78 percent of the streetcar funding, leaving 668 million for fiscal year 15 through 25, and the delays will continue because the executive will be forced to withdraw its RFQ for the for, to bring in a, a firm to design, build, and operate the system. So we will continue as we are. And I think that any previous mismanagement by the current mayor should not be foisted upon and assumed that the next mayor would do the same. This is a budget possibility, it's certainly an investment for the, the future, and we're, we're passing on an investment of a generation. 
that the future of our city is dependent upon public transit. There is no way we can continue to build out the southwest waterfront and add a soccer stadium unless there is substantial new public transit. I know I would have to vote against a soccer stadium without a strong plan for public transit because it's a landlocked area where there's not enough roads to support car and bus space by itself. Additionally, transportation is second only to the cost of housing for those families living in D.C. at or above poverty. Public transit and local public transit is the future for transit equity. It does not matter if you get a job at Georgetown University, our number one private employer, if you live east of the river and you can't get there in a safe, reliable manner. The worst public transit in D.C. is east of the river. We need public transit that is safe and reliable, that we control the cost. The metro cost goes up and up. I lived on minimum wage for seven days, only seven days. My number one problem was public transit. I could not afford to ride the metro, as many people cannot afford to ride the metro system on minimum wage. So we have to have a public transit system that moves people to jobs, activity centers, and the other amenities that make this city great so that people on limited income can continue to participate in our city as we grow it out. So the idea that we should just finish the 8th Street line and then maybe add another line does not invest in the future of the city. So again, I think that this is critical enough to transit equity, to the future growth of our city. I know that it impacts the decisions that we have to make about where we grow and how we grow and who we grow for that um, it's serious enough to me that I will not be able to support this budget today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Uh, we have this amendment from Councilmember Bowser. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, I would hope that you would accept the amendment, Mr. Chairman, as friendly. Um, had the opportunity to discuss with you and Councilmember Che uh, a transfer of $7 million um, from unused money in the South Capitol Bridge project to go to um, the planning in the uh, fiscal year 15 uh, for a standalone middle school in, in Ward 4. As you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ward 4 is alone in the city and not having a standalone middle school. Um, and uh, many discussions in the deputy mayor's office contemplate um, the creation of um, up to two uh, new middle schools in Ward 4. Um, this planning, uh, these planning dollars would allow for um, those plans to commence, commence in fiscal um, 2015. Um, and so I'd like to, to move this for um, your consideration. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Bowser. Uh, I have the, the budget office, the budget director, Ms. Budoff, just gave me the FIS. So we do have the FIS, that there's no um, adverse impact. Uh, if there's no objection, this will be accepted. Hearing no objection, Mr. it's Chairman. accepted. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have a few questions. Uh, before, okay, Mr. Catania. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, through you to the maker of the amendment. Uh, have you uh, discussed this uh, $7 million um, transfer with the Deputy Mayor for Education or with the Chancellor? No, I haven't. Um, have you uh, been able to cost out with uh, Department of General Services whether or not $7 million is in fact enough to do the planning of this one or multiple middle schools? Um, actually, uh, we, we've looked and reviewed uh, similar planning dollars for other schools, including um, in this budget, and it is, is comparable. Um, but planning is uh, different than construction, and so the idea, of course, Ms. Bowser, is not just to plan but to construct. If we simply plan but don't and have not identified the dollars to construct, it is kind of a bridge to nowhere. Have you identified, after we've spent the $7 million, where the funds will come to actually build the middle school or middle schools? I think uh, uh, future budgets will, will, will plan for the construction funding. I'm sorry, um, my, I couldn't overhear. Um, I said future budgets will have to, uh, to include the construction funding. In addition, not to for, may, for, may just, I, for just this middle school, um, but we know if the city Ms. is Bowser, to, to grow Ms. Bowser, and continue Ms. to. Ms. Bowser, may I reclaim um, my time? Yeah, no, certainly. Let me finish if, if answering I, if I might, You've problems. answered my question. The, my no, question but, was, the, no, the, the Ms. Bowser, question, my yeah. question was whether or not there's money in the budget to build the middle I school that your you're question, planning. And you answered my question by saying no. Um, Ms. Bowser, how much uh, was the, what was the expense of the most recently built independent standing middle school in our city? 
I believe the one under construction in Brookland is, is over $50 million. It's $79 million mm -hmm. and counting. And so I want to be clear that we may be spending $7 million planning a building that we don't have the funds to construct. And that's a bit of false hope. Uh, and we're going to have to look at what projects we won't build if we're going to build a middle school or middle schools in place of this. And these funds could, uh, these dollars could uh, displace funds that are going for, among other things, uh, Banneker and Ellington. And the list kind of goes Actually, on and on. Actually, Mr. Catania, that's, in, that's inaccurate. Uh, Ms. Bowser, I think you'll have an opportunity to be recognized when it's your time. I'm simply saying I'm looking at costs <laughs> that expenses in 17 and 18 for which we would be building middle schools because we, we are at a bit of a zero-sum game being up against the cap on spending and we're operating within very tight budgets. And so as I look at the six-year capital improvement plan by ward and by school, Mr. Chairman, I see that you know schools, unless there are new dollars that come, and we are having a budget that is very tight. Unless new dollars come, displacement will happen. So I'm simply asking you know, whether or not there are the funds really to build what we hope to have done and whether it might not make sense, Mr. Chairman, for us to look at using dollars to plan generally uh, what we may need to do with respect to feeder patterns and boundaries generally as opposed to take the limited dollars and spend them only on middle schools, which we can all agree are important. And so I guess my last question is, Mr. Chairman, through you to Ms. Bowser, why not spend these dollars to look at, and I think it's something we've talked about that makes sense, planning generally how whatever future boundary and feeder system uh, uh, solutions come forward, we spend the dollars to, to plan the entire system, not just predetermine how and where we spend the money. I'm certainly happy um, to work with you, Mr. Catania, moving forward, but um, if it pleases the Chairman, um, I, I'm prepared to vote on the amendment. Well, I, I certainly, Mr. Chairman, if we, if we have opportunities for a second round on this, let me, I'd like to be recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Catania. Uh, further, with regard to this amendment, um, I, I do want to note this, because I got a note from General Counsel. Uh, that this amendment would be made to the table instead to, of to the text of the Budget Request Act. Uh, and a lot of the details in the tables that accompany the Budget Request Act. And in addition, the amendment is that which is underlined. And I say that only to ensure that if there is any retyping that occurred, and there probably isn't, that might have changed something, the amendment here is that which is underlined. Um, if there's no objection, this amendment is accepted. Uh, further, Councilmember Bowser? Not at this time, Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Che? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also have some amendments, but I believe we're still waiting on our fiscal. I effects. think we have them here. Oh, we have them? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, the first, I'm looking for my helper here to distribute it. Um, is, well, I'll start with a technical amendment that I have. Um, actually, Mr. Chairman, please indulge me. I'm waiting for the copies. Uh, if there's no objection, uh, let me ask uh, if... Wait a minute. Okay. We may have them. I don't, I'm not sure. Nope, we don't. Um, if somebody else needs to go... Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on the uh, bill at this point? Mr. Chairman, I, I, I just have a, a question. Actually, I, I don't know if it's to Councilmember Che or to you or both, but I, um, I believe we all received this letter from uh, ATU Local 689, and they were proposing an amendment. And since we're talking about streetcars and uh, transportation systems, just wondering was there any resolution on, on their proposed amendment where it appears in my reading of this that they support the system. However, they're saying it should exclude non-regional bus service currently operated by, by WMATA in facilities that are, are, are located here in the District of Columbia. And so while we want to make sure that we have a, a system that everyone can utilize and that it's uh, reasonably priced, we also want to make sure that we maintain uh, work for our workers, especially our workforce has been here for a very long time working on this. So my question is uh, to Councilman Che or to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. What is the resolution, if any, on the uh, on this letter that was circulated on March 27th to the mayor, 
and I believe sent to all council members. Councilmember Che, do you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, the subtitle that you're referring to in the Mayor's uh, Budget Support Act is the Integrated Premium Transit Systems Amendment Act of 2014, and that legislation, which was drafted by the Mayor, would clarify DDOT's authority to contract for various types of transit services, including local non-regional bus service <coughs> operated by WMATA. Uh, the union, as I understand it, is concerned that DDOT may one day want to take over the local bus service from WMATA, and that's to be expected because every other jurisdiction already runs their own local service, Arlington, for example, Fairfax. But I want to be clear about something. DDOT already has the authority now to do this, the subtitle does not change that authority, and the mayor's office has told the union this, my staff has told the union this, and for whatever reason, the union does not understand that. So um, this is not changing the authority that they already have. Uh, and my answer, Mr. Orange, would be that um, this is germane to the Budget Support Act, and I spoke with Ms. Jeter uh, right before this meeting and said that I would look at this more closely and talk with Councilmember Che and if need be we would address it at second reading on the Budget Support Act. Oh, <laughs> okay, so we will have opportunity to address this. It's too. in the BSA. Okay, so and, it's, let me just close by, by saying I believe uh, what Ms. Che, what you're saying is absolutely right and that's the reason why they want this new language that says excluding non-regional bus service currently operated by WMATA so they can at least be assured of being uh, the ones that actually uh, implement the non-regional bus service. But since we will be able to discuss this between now and um, next session, uh, I'll wait to uh, see how that uh, progresses. Thank you. Mr. Councilmember Chair, are you ready? Mr. Chairman? Councilmember Chair. Um, okay, now I'm ready with my amendments. The first one is a... Um, technical amendment that shifts $2.8 million in fiscal 2015 PAYGO within my committee to close a $1.5 million budget gap in DPW, which actually wasn't identified until late last night by the CFO, and then to also shift $1.25 million within DDOT's capital budget to increase the funding for the Kennedy Street Streetscape project. And I would ask that this be accepted. Uh, what's being handed out is the second amendment. Oh. Did you... Uh Right amendment. Though. No, it's the right amendment. We just don't have the FIS on the first one. It's that 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 is the technical amendment. Which is this one? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one, two, three. So there's three amendments on here. One moment. Uh, there are two things to close this 1.5 million gap in DP that was identified at DPW, and then to shift 1.25 million within DDOT's capital budget to funding for the Kennedy Street streetscape. Okay, let me ask if the budget director is clear on this. Yes. She says she's clear on this. So I would ask that that be accepted as friendly with, if there's no if objection. If there's no objection, uh, it's accepted. Okay, uh, and now I'd like to offer a second amendment, if I may. So I need, yes. I need help here distributing this. Thank you. With Council Members uh, Grasso and Wells, I'm moving an amendment that would waive public space occupancy fees for farmers markets. The amendment to the BRA would uh, recognize $41,000 in savings in DDOT's permitting division. A companion amendment to the BSA would waive the fees for farmers markets. Farmers markets expand access to healthy foods, particularly in neighborhoods without grocery stores, but currently the district charges farmers market fees to locate their markets in public space. The amount received annually from these fees is $41,000. These fees can sometimes create a barrier to opening new farmers markets and increases the cost of operating the farmers market. This amendment would waive the public space occupancy charged to farmers markets in order to encourage more farmers uh, to locate in the district and to lower the cost of the food sold at these markets. And uh, I don't know if council members uh, Grasso or Wells have any comments, but I would hope the amendment would be accepted as friendly. 
Council and we just have a fiscal. We just now have the fiscal impact statement, I believe, saying there's no fiscal impact. Uh, I Mr. believe Chairman. that's correct, since I'm sitting next to the uh, budget director, uh, Councilor Grasso. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Che for moving this uh, today with me and Tommy Wells. Uh, I think it's important for us to continue to nurture as many uh, farmers market opportunities in the district. Uh, they add a lot to the neighborhood, as we know from uh, years of experience, and uh, this barrier to their opening is, is something that's very real. So uh, with that, I look forward to people supporting this. Thank you. Councilmember Wells? Just to reiterate that there's a strong public interest in seeing that fresh foods go to where in areas that we call food deserts and by the, you know, getting rid of the public space cost. This is, again, part of, I think, I think it's a very appropriate public, public goal. And I believe that the cost was only $41,000. So the, the return is pretty extraordinary considering that we can get fresh food to areas that otherwise do not have easy opportunity to get it. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wells. Further discussion on this? Councilmember Che, did you want to say more? No, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. We have this before us. Bill? Councilmember Catania. Uh, thank you all very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the members of the Committee on Education for their support of the committee recommendations that are before us today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today's budget is really a breakthrough, a milestone in public education in our city's history. Uh, following the authoring of the Fair Funding Bill, uh, the bill that I authored last year, we worked very hard with the executive to secure funds for students that are identified as being at risk for failure. As a result of the committee's work, uh, Mr. Chairman, there will be nearly $80 million more in this year's budget for students who are identified as at risk. Uh, this is the largest investment in this community, in this city's history. We've identified, based on research, the following students who are at risk of academic failure. These are students who are homeless, students who are in the foster care system, students who are eligible for SNAP, which is, uh, sub, which is uh, food stamps, students eligible for TANF, which is welfare, and high school students who are one year older than their peers, which reflects perhaps that they've been retained. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as a result of the committee's work, there will be in excess of $2,200 for every student in our city that meets that uh, definition. And Mr. Chairman, with nearly $80 million flowing to our schools, these dollars are necessary uh, because it is, they are intended to fund the interventions that we know will set children up to succeed. These are issues like smaller class sizes, longer school days, longer school years, technology to support, not supplant teachers, additional social emotional support, additional reading and math intervention. Mr. Chairman, funding alone is not the salvation to our schools, but it's going to go a long way to funding the interventions we know we need to make a difference so that there can be high quality neighborhood schools in every corner of our city. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's coupled with some of the other work of the committee over the last year, and I want to thank again the committee for their support, not the, the least of which is ending the social promotion which required by operation of law children be promoted in every grade but the third, fifth, and eighth in our city, almost ensuring that they reach high school unprepared for the rigors of high school, which of course, under, understandably, we would know that 30% of our kids as a result fail ninth grade and are retained. That's why we have ninth graders who are often 19 years of age. Uh, higher standards, greater investments in summer school and at-risk kids as a part of this budget, Mr. Chairman, are important. Uh, I'd like to mention one other thing that we're particularly proud of, and that is the investment. Uh, and I want to thank Councilmember Alexander for the resources that her committee added to my committee so that we could double down on a brand new application middle school for wards seven and eight uh, to provide necessary high quality middle school services to a community badly in need of them. Uh, this is an investment that took place after more than a year of conversations with the chancellor, extensive engagement with the community, public surveys about what it is this community wanted and hopes for, and I think we've set the foundation for a really successful new middle school option for our residents in East Washington. So I wanted to thank the committee and thank Ms. Alexander for helping to support the funding for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to supporting this request act. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Katan. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Mr. Rebella. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, and I want to just, uh, of course, want to congratulate you and um, the committee staff on um, the budget that's before us. I think that there are uh, a lot of good things um, to, to look into this budget, including investments in affordable housing and really policies that will help us grow the middle class in the District of Columbia. And so I uh, enthusiastically support them. Um, I did want to um, pose a, a question uh, to Mr. Catania through you. Um, that uh, issues that were called out in the mayor's letter to us. Just to be clear about how um, the grants that are included here, I think $2 million a piece, um, how uh, the public charter schools can apply for those grants um, and what exactly those grant dollars can be used for. Mr. Catania. Uh, I think, uh, Ms. Bowser, the language is fairly self-explanatory. These are grants for two, sc oh, for two types of schools that they can apply for. It's not unlike what we've done in the past, uh, where w this committee, uh, this council, while you served on it, uh, provided similar grants for the Hospitality High School. But if you'd like specific information, I'd be happy to give it to you. Yes, I would like to specifically know um, the location of the language immersion school. There's been a lot of discussion, of course, um, and we fought very hard to, to be sure that a language immersion school called DCI could locate at Walter Reed. Um, and, that, and I just need to understand how that $2 million will be used for DCI at Walter Reed. Uh, the $2 million provided that uh, DCI and the five schools that are participating in DCI choose to apply for the grant, the grant could be used for any number of pre-financing and pre-construction planning uh, that is, of course, necessary for the school to take root. Uh, the specifics of the grant-making process we delegated to the Deputy Mayor for uh, Education the ability to issue these grants pursuant to uh, the rules established by her office. Okay, now is the is DCI, might they use that for, for another location? Or it, have they indicated that they would use it for Walter Reed? Uh, in other words, because I know they're looking, um, and they, they have a need for a temporary location before they get to Walter Reed. And I just want to know um, if this is going to be used for the temporary location or their permanent home at Walter Reed. Well, provided again that DCI and the five schools that will make up DCI apply for it and are the recipients, they've assured uh, at least to me and my staff, these $2 million, as I mentioned, are going to be used for pre-development costs to finish design work to pay for certain required surveys and fees related to building permits and to launch the construction. And they have given me every reason to believe that it will be at Walter Reed. Okay. Um, and secondly, um, I'm aware of only one school that fits the criteria of $2 million classical public charter school um, at Washington Latin, of course, which we work very hard um, to make sure that they would have access to the former um, Rudolph uh, School in Ward 4. Um, and they, uh, to my knowledge, are built out, and I want to just understand specifically what the $2 million would be used for. Uh, this will be uh, used in partnership with the funds that uh, Washington Latin are raising privately and part of their own um, allocations for uh, uh, capital to, to fund a $4.7 million facility improvement, which will be a gymnasium and community space um, uh, facility. And just lastly, uh, Mr. Catania, uh, just without object, I just have I, one I have question. Objection. I might just uh, note for the record that they have raised themselves $1.6 million for the final phase. And so the school, what we're doing is, is, is very much in the spirit of a matching grant uh, to provide a much needed facility for what is one of our premier charter schools in the city, serving 640 students from every ward including 8.5 percent. No, I'm familiar with it. May I reclaim my time, Mr. Mr. Uh, Catania? And let me just uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, ask you um, this question, because I think these are uh, laudable projects indeed, um, but I think all of the public charter schools would want to know what the process is um, so that they, uh, if their facility funds available, might make a similar case. And I think that would be important for the Council and its rules moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I Thank answer you, the question? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may uh, without, any, without objection, Thanks. Mr. Catania, just on that right. last point. Uh, but the process, uh, Ms. Bowser, is a quite a simple one. Uh, representatives from the schools came during the budget process and testified and put on the record 
uh, what projects they were interested in, what funds they were interested in seeking, and why, and how it would benefit the school and the city collectively. Uh, following their participation in the budget process, uh, the recommendation was made to the Committee of Education. These were unanimously approved, and they find themselves before us today. Thank you. And, and lastly, I would just say, uh, I know, I know, I, I just, for the permanent, for the first $2 million we talked about, I think it would be helpful if there was language to say that it was for the permanent location. Would you object to that, Mr. Catania? Well, I think, um, Ms. Bowser, we're waiting candidly for the final dispensation. I don't have a, a bit of a problem with, with that, but if for whatever reason Delano Hall doesn't work out, I, I wouldn't want to uh, foreclose other options, but I guess, uh, I, I don't have an objection to making sure that the funds are used for um, the, the location in Ward 4. Thank you. Mr. General Councilman, yeah. that's in the Budget Support Act, correct? Yes, yes, it is. So if Councilman Bowser wants to do that and Mr. Catania is agreeable, well, that would be when we get to the Budget Support Act. Mr. Barry? Mr. Chairman, let me apologize for just getting here. I said when I have this serious illness, I'm going to put my health first. It goes above anything, anywhere, in anybody. And when I talked to you last night, and you indicated, or my staff indicated, that you had moved the sessions to 12 o'clock. I got busy trying to call my physical therapy, and I couldn't reach them. Now, the bottom line is, I had to find another one temporarily to do this, and so I hope the citizens understand, or the members of the council understand. Uh, I had my running suit on and just left physical therapy. Now to the issue that Mr. Katani was speaking on, I want to thank Mr. Katani for his leadership of our education committee. He has been uh, fantastic in terms of diligence. He's outworked all of us, he visited over 130 some schools, and he cares deeply about these children and young people and their parents. Now, we have political differences. Uh, he's an independent, uh, Republican, I don't know which, and I'm a good um, Democrat. And so we have not let that stand in the way. We, as well known, Dave and I used to beef all the time for some reason or another. He, either he's beefing with me, I'm beefing with him. But when we got a point chair of the committee, he and I sat down and decided to stop that nonsense, that the children and the parents needed us to be focused on education. If you look at the record, you'll find that we have been focused together on a number of his, his bills. I supported, you know, we're going to have some reservations about one or two, his bills. And so I want the record to be clear that I support uh, our committee's recommendations entirely. I have one amendment to make later on, but I'll talk to David about it before we uh, do that. And to the issue, as much as I support Ms. Bowser, and I do support her strongly, I disagree with her on this. I think the chairman is right in terms of putting in law just in case something happens down the hall to that. So I would, I would urge her uh, to, at the right time, put it somewhere else. But we need to have some clarity on everything that we do. And so, uh, David, you, you can agree to it, fine with me, but I want to speak about the problem itself. That's all, because you've done a fantastic job of uh, leading this committee. And so, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll wait until after we all finish, Mr. Chairman, for an opening statement. Well, we're pretty much done, and you've used up your time. I'd like well, to I'm not going to take that, Phil. Come on. Well, um, uh, is there anybody else who wishes to speak on the Budget uh, Request Act? Mr. Graham? Mr. Graham, you have an amendment? <coughs> uh, 
Senate Moving an amendment which would <coughs> establish the Committee on Human Services recommendation that there not be a 42% cut in TANF on October the 1st, 2014. There are funds sufficient within the committee's budget to support this action by transferring funds from the TANF employment program. Now, first off, everybody wants, most definitely including me, to move people from welfare to work. We don't want people to be dependent upon welfare. But the question is, is DC's TANF employment program succeeding in doing that? In other words, are we creating jobs? Are we moving people to jobs? And if we are moving people to jobs, let's recognize it. But the answer is mostly no. On October the 1st, 2014, 6,637 TANF families who have been on TANF for 60 months or longer will have a 42% cut in their TANF benefit. The October cut will impact over 11,000 children under the age of 13. Let me repeat that. This cut will impact over 11,000 children under the age of 13. So the TANF employment program has given very few TANF families the ability to absorb any cuts. DA, the Department of Human Services has said, quote, this population represents the hardest to serve customers, most of whom have been without employment for an extended period of time, and are either unequipped for the job force or not accustomed to working. How are all these families going to live with this 42% cut while waiting for a job? A 42% cut under these circumstances, in my opinion, is heartless. And let me be clear, this reduces a family of three, a family of three to a monthly benefit of $153. This reduces a family of three, if we don't turn this around, to a monthly benefit of $153. Now, how many people that are watching this hearing or watching this markup today or who are in our audience could take a 41% cut in your salary? But that is exactly what we are proposing to do on October the 1st. Now, let me give you some important statistics here, and I've actually passed around sheets on this so that those of you can follow this, because sometimes the numbers are difficult to follow. Of the 6,637 60-plus month TANF families, only 470 have received a full-time or part-time job from the TANF employment program, which has lasted for more than six months. There are currently 1,427 TANF customers, TANF families, who are working either full-time or part-time jobs. However, about 44% of those are earning $10 an hour or less. More than half have only part-time jobs. 588 are waiting to be referred to a TANF vendor and are not receiving any services at all at this point. 1,685 have been referred to a TANF vendor but aren't showing up. And this is a, this is a very important phenomenon here because we have a large number of no-shows who are unengaged in these programs and their opportunities they provide. We can't condemn these people. We've got to figure out ways to reach them and bring them into the program so that they can be uh, put their lives back together again and have a full-time job. For about 300,000, excuse me, 3,000 families, their current status is entirely unclear. There are sufficient t town of employment funds in the FY 2015 budget remaining after the transfer to expand and enhance the program. What is the point of this is these folks are not ready and cannot sustain a 42% cut in their monthly income. It can't be done. And so those of you who are talking about family homelessness and the great crisis that we had this past February, expect more of it in the future Expect more of it in February of next year, January of next year, if this cut goes into effect. Who can live in the District of Columbia on $153 a month and support two child children? Who can do it? No one. And so I think it is absolutely imperative that we take funds from the Town of Employment Program. There's still money there. There's still money there for expansion because we have no place else to take it from, frankly, and move it so that we can avoid this cut for one year. And Mr. Chairman, that is my amendment. Yeah, I talked to him. Oh, she votes against it. She does.
Thank you, Mr. Graham. I will not accept this, and I would urge members to not uh, <clears throat> vote for this. Um, my first reason is that um, we've been through this before. We went through this last year, and we've been through this before. We went through this two years ago, and we went through this three years ago, and maybe even four years ago. And every year, it's we're going to put it off one more year. The mayor noted in his letter that in each of the last two years, the council and human services advocates have requested more funding for TANF job training. And so the mayor puts the training dollars in, and now you cut the training dollars, and you cut the training dollars in order to perpetuate continuation on welfare. And this is not just continuation on welfare. This is, uh, as, as I understand it, continuation on welfare for not just years, but for decades. That the whole nature of TANF, which was created in the 1990s, was that it was five years and was help people help people to get from welfare to work. And true, we may not have done a great job of it in the past, but I remember two years ago it was we couldn't do the cut. It was three years ago we couldn't do the cuts because um, the assessments hadn't been done. That was why the assessments hadn't been done. Well, now the assessments have been been done. And last year I guess it was because the training wasn't in place. Well, now the training dollars are there. So there's another reason. And actually I think this is really a very cruel amendment, because what is in the law, what we adopted last year was that this year we would phase down so that a person wouldn't just hit the cliff and go over it with a hundred percent. Um, cancellation of their benefits, but rather it would transition. Uh, but with this amendment, it would be a 100% cliff. So we would continue the full benefits this year, even though all these folks know that because we've been discussing this for several years, that the benefits were going to come to an end. So here we would cut training, restore the full benefits, and then in a year, the benefits will be eliminated. And uh, but I think the, the the hardest part about this is the the notion that we would say we wanted more dollars for training, and then we would turn around and when the mayor puts the training dollars in, we cut them, and we cut them not to help people to get training. And I realize that people there are some people who aren't participating, and the solution to that is not to cut the training dollars, but to get them into the training, and rather than provide the training, which is perpetuate these people. So I would urge members to, um, to, to not support, to vote against this amendment. Uh, and I would also note that this was discussed at our um, work session last week. And my sense then was that members were not supportive of it. Well, point of information, Mr. Uh, Chair. No, is there anybody else who wishes to? Point of information, to, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Wells. Well, a couple, I have a question for Mr. Graham. But um, I, I am, I do want to note that, that what we're doing if we don't adopt this, is we're undoing what the committee voted on to do. So before we do that, um, this would restore to what the committee had done and which came out unanimously, if I remember correctly. Let me ask Mr. Graham, do people avoid, can those on TANF that are being sanctioned in this way, can they avoid sanction by just showing up to a training program or to an assigned program, or is this an automatic cut due to time? This, this is an automatic cut due to time. So there's no way, it's not that they're not participating in a program, it's just a function of time. 6,600 families will have this cut. But it's only a function of time, it's not a sanction based. Only a function of time. Because I, I have been concerned about the, and if Mr. Graham you want to say anything about this, so this is a program that started under Clarence Carter in the previous administration. It was based on implement, a full implementation of a case assessment and then getting people to follow their case assessment and then they can um, you know, move forward. I have been concerned about the, the director who just left making the implementation so that we will have a system similar to Maryland's to where you get a recommendation based on your assessment. What is the status of people being able to participate, as Mr. Mendelson brings up, that one of the pro programs or problems is you need the training program to be there. What is the, um, your assessment of what the previous director be able to create so that people can move off of TANF? Why are these folks not moving because the program's not there, or are they not moving for some other reason? I, I'm trying to understand if Mr. Mendelson's right, that we're just promoting a perpetuation of a failed system. 
Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, I think it's fair, and, and thank you also for noting that this was the unanimous vote of the Committee on Human Services to roll back this, this, this cut. And I also want to say that, Mr. Mendelson, you're mistaken when you say we're restoring full benefits. This would mean that a family of three would have $250 a month instead of $150 a month. But when you have nothing, when you have nothing, you know, $100 is a lot of money. Uh, Mr. Wells, as you know very, very well, what we're trying to do here is to solve chronic generational poverty. And the fact of the matter is that nobody's got that magic wand. Nobody has the solutions. We know that we can move people from dependency through a job program, through literacy, through substance abuse, through mental health, through other issues, so that they can get a job and they can begin to provide for their family. But this is no easy task. And, and the fact of the matter is that we're doing this, we're cutting 42% when we're just starting out. And this would be a blow like they have never received before because we've had already made, Mr. Mendelssohn, three cuts. This is not the first cut. This is the third cut. The final cut will be a year from now. I won't be here to share in that responsibility when hopefully we will have a better employment program in place and we can do, then take people off of welfare who have been on it for 60 months or more. But, Mr. Mr. Wells, that's the issue. Is this is very, very difficult. DHS has acknowledged that this population represents the hardest to serve customers. And they're not being served. So what are we going to We're doing like Georgia. Georgia just ended, ended their benefits. It said, good luck. That's what we're doing with this cut on the, on the 1st of October. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a lineup here. Um, Councilman McGrath. Mr. Chairman, I want to fit in the lineup. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a few questions through you to the chairman of the committee. I'm not on the committee. and. Certainly want to res respect the unanimous vote of the committee and just have a few questions to Mr. Graham. In the statement that you gave us to look at or in the facts that you gave us to look at, you note here that um, 588 of these individuals are waiting to be referred to a TANF vendor and are not receiving services. Does, whose fault is that? I mean, where, where does the fault lie there? Is it the agency not doing it, the vendor not doing it? Why aren't these folks getting the services? And if the chairman's correct, and we've been working on this issue for three years. What's been the delay? You know, what's happening with this program? I think it's a very good point that you raise. Uh, and keep in mind that this is a city flush with cash. Flush with cash. More than a billion dollars in our savings account. Let me repeat that. More than a billion dollars in our savings Mr. Graham, account. If you could just desperately answer. need this four million dollars from the poorest of the poor. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, I just don't have a lot of Grosso, time, as you know. I well, just I'll, hope you I'll can help me time back to you then. get through but this. Mr. Grosso, the problem here is there have been the difficulties in putting together a TANF employment program that works. That works. And we have found out that it's not working. It's not working. And yet, you know, to, to create a working situation with the current vendors makes more sense to me while we spare people the harshness of this cut. 42% cut. Let's work with the vendors so we become more effective. Thank you. And one last question on that angle. What What about this no-shows? Who was the no-show on this? I don't understand that. So was it the the folks that are actually trying to get the service didn't show up, or the vendor didn't show up to do the service? And you know, this this goes to a bigger problem in our city around coordination of workforce development programs, uh, which I'm hoping that we can get some resolution to with the new FTE at the WIC, you know, to start investigating these things and doing that kind of oversight is important. But who's the no-show in this so, for the record, we can really get after them? Because that's just a dereliction of duty. No, no, I'm asking uh, general, Mr. Graham general. for the Mr. Graham. definition of the no-show. Well, the definition of a no-show is, 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 is a family yeah, that has been referred yeah, to the easy. vendor program and simply doesn't show up. And this was a problem that our committee uncovered last September. We've had a series of yeah. hearings on all of this. And we said, let's develop a program that reaches out to them. I mean, you can say, let them eat cake and the hell with them. You can say that. Or you can say, they have a major pro set of problems. We've got to work with these people where they are. And we said, let's do this. And, but we haven't, we haven't created an effective program. And there's still literally thousands of people who are being cut, 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 who aren't showing up to be helped. 
That's not our problem. Excuse me, that's not just their problem. It's all of our problems to deal with. If you understand well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I'm, uh, this one here really has me torn. And, I, you know, I've been listening to this debate for a number of years now. And, you know, in the end, what I want to do is have faith that our job training programs are going to get the job done that they're told to get done. And then if they're not, they're going to be held accountable and they're going to be dismissed from service and we're going to bring in a different vendor that's going to actually get it done right. I also hope that we can have the wraparound services in place that can give these people the benefit, you know, the supports they need in order to succeed in these programs. And that goes back to our adult literacy questions. That goes back to mental health services and all of the things we've talked about um, in this budget process ad nauseum. Um, so I, you know, I'm going to continue to listen to the discussion and, and see where I come out on this. But Mr. Grosso, uh, can I add just one thing, please, with your indulgence? Certainly. Uh, this I want to be very cl clear. About 50 percent of those referred to TANF vendors are not showing up. So forget the numbers. 50 percent are not showing up. But give but what, I mean, then, Mr. Graham, then are we supposed to just keep paying for them to you know not show up, or or should we? try to do more to help them get there and, and ultimately uh, hold the vendors accountable when they don't do the job. That's, I mean, that's the, really the, the crux of the issue here. So well, we need to have a special program aimed at this enormous number of no-shows. But that's what we heard last year, and that's what we heard the year before. And so when does it end? How do we get that done? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me. Thank Jim Graham for his courage, for his tenacity, for his caring heart, for all the things that makes him a wonderful human being. And when I want to say that to Jim. I've said him. I've known him over 40 years. He's been unwavering in his caring about people. When he was at Whitman Walker, he was unwavering in caring about people. And so now we face this issue. Let me just say right now, no urban city in America has solved this problem satisfactorily. Not one. And we're no different than that. Poverty is the root cause of a lot of these problems. For instance, studies have shown very clearly that poverty, kids who come out of poverty, come to school less prepared, not ability prepared. They score low on, record, on tests. They have more behavior problems. I'm more likely to have a child of young age. I'm more likely to drop out of high school. I'm more likely to start or graduate from college. And I'm more likely to be poor as adults. The way you get children out of poverty, you get their parents out of poverty. And Mr. Graham is exactly right. I don't see how any of you who have a heart can, can vote to put $5 million in the Humane Society. And I support the Humane Society. I own animals myself. But you can put $5 million for animals that, that are good people, to good perks, good dogs. I'm sorry. I'm so fired up and so angry about this in, in, in terms of people. Mr. Graham is right. They are 11 thousand people. But more importantly, Mr. Chairman, I'm on put do this. Yeah. I'm on human services. I'm not seeing you at one of our meetings to discuss anything. I'm not heard you talk to Deborah Carroll about anything. Mr. Barron about anything. And all of a sudden you don't know anything about you don't know one thing about the work training program. Not one Ms. Catania does, because he was head of DOS for a while. But not one. I think it's wrong on the citizens to have you not knowing anything about something, not knowing the impact, and you do it. I know I'm not going to change any votes probably, but I don't care about that. God put me on earth to be truthful and to be honest about it. These poor people are suffering. In Ward 8, 82% of the families are headed by female heads of household. There are black boys in Ward 8 in low-income communities who has never seen a black man get to work. And let me answer the question about no-shows. As you said, Mr. Graham, Mr. this is Perry, generational. Time has Wait a minute, Mr. Chairman. If this is generational. No one Give me one more minute. This is generational. 
Their mothers were more than likely on welfare. Their grandmothers more than likely were on welfare. So bad habits have been formed over the years. They become dependent on the federal and local government. Jim Graham and I and the members of the committee, we're trying to break that dependency. Mr. Garoso, if you knew this population, which you don't, you would be able to know why they don't show. It's habit, bad habits. Their kids are, uh, are tardy in school, going to school. They, they break doctor's appointments. They use the emergency room as their primary care physician. That's what they've been accustomed to. That's what they've seen all their lives. And you know and I know, you are what you think. And if you think something a certain way, then that I urge every member of this council not to be political. Don't vote for the chairman because he's off base, or he's this and that. Vote against the chairman because he's inhumane about his children. That's all. Mr. Berry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, council member, um, is there any other council member who wishes to speak on this? Mr. Catania. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask this is both to you and to Mr. Graham. Um, Mr. Berry offered uh, his thoughts as to why individuals are no-shows, but have we actually uh, gone, just out of curiosity, have we actually gone to some of the no-shows in person to, to, try to, to try to understand why people aren't showing up? I mean, you know, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt, but you know, is it an instance of perhaps, you know, a failure of notice, or is it transportation or child care? You know, um, these are not excuses, but they're explanations. Do we have any evidence to suggest that we know why people aren't showing up? And this uh, is to you and to Mr. Graham. Well, I'll answer first. I've, I've, in discussing this with Mr. Graham, have pointed out that uh, years ago, you'll remember Mr. Catania, Mr. Graham will remember that there uh, was a proposal to uh, criminalize failure to appear in court, and the argument against criminalizing it was that if we made phone calls, the prosecutor called a witness, uh, they'd show up or a defendant, they'd show up. And in fact, that's exactly what happened, was with phone calls, people uh, started to show up. And I think that's analogous to this situation. If we do nothing, well, then ask, uh, we uh, perpetuate the no-show, and if we do something, then we reduce the no-show. But Mr. Chairman, that, that gets me, I mean, that gets me part of the answer, and that answer is if we do something punitive, and I think there's no, a... No, I didn't mean punitive. A phone call is not punitive. Oh, if there's a, if there's a fear associated with it, a fear of criminal criminality or something like that. If, if that was not my point. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, do we know why, have we, have we done any sampling just to understand more completely? Because I think that, I, I, I'm struck by it appears that we're going at this at a 30,000 foot level instead of actually trying to understand why people aren't showing up. And I'm not excusing folks not showing up, but I'd like to know why. If the answer is, well, we just don't feel like it, that's not a satisfactory explanation. If it's transportation or notice, you know, that's interesting. Is If it's the fact that people aren't showing up because they feel the whole process, the whole exercise is pointless and hopeless, that it is kind of a, a, a not a real training process. It's not really set them up to succeed. It's so people can check a box and say we've done something. You know, I, I'd like to know more why people aren't yeah, showing up. Well, I'll let Mr. Graham, I mean, yeah, Mr. Graham respond in a second. The mayor's letter implies that because we perpetuate the benefits, there is no incentive to show up at the edge. So, for so the is there not a way, and I apologize, Mr. Chairman, but is there a way to, 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 to split the difference here? Rather than the way Mr. Graham described the cuts, the cuts are automatic whether you show up or not. That's the way I understood Mr. Graham as suggesting that. Is that your understanding, Mr. Chairman? If you're asking me, no, yes. that's not my understanding, but Mr. Graham knows this better. Let me just say, I, I think, Mr. Catania, you put your finger right on it. I think we're dealing in part with a group of people who are extremely frustrated by the efforts that have been made. If you've ever been to one of these classes where people are writing resumes, been to the writing resume class, which is an interesting, an interesting exercise to go through, but the fact of the matter, all this training, all this education is for naught if there's not a job waiting that people can, can produce an income for people. And Mr. Katami, you're right. The fact of the matter is that people are fed up with these efforts. But We've been, we have been through this before. We do have a home visitation program which was created <coughs> at the insistence of our committee. And we are beginning to reach out to people. But the fact of the matter is that we still have, and this is not just the 60-monthers, this is all TANF recipients. People have been on there for a short time and a long time who are just not showing up. 
50% no-shows. We've so, got to understand the phenomenon better. So, Mr. Graham, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand, and Mr. Chairman, if you'll permit me one more question. Are the benefits reduced if a person shows up? Mr. Chairman? Yes, uh, yes. Are the benefits it's an automatic reduction, Mr. Catania, if, depending if upon the 60 months. If the individual shows up and tries, the benefits are reduced? They're reduced. All right. Mr. Chairman, why isn't there a, another way to thread the needle? And I understand what you're saying about having consequences. <coughs> uh, and if people have had dual notice and haven't and are refusing to show up, then I understand the consequence. What I'm having a difficult time wrestling with is a consequence if they are showing up. <coughs> That's my problem. And do we know what percentage of the, of the folks affected are, are showing up? And Mr. Graham mentioned, what is it, 40? 50% aren't showing. Is there a way to split this, Mr. Chairman? 50% are showing up. In other words, and have the reduction. And 50% are going to have their, their benefits cut by 42% on October the 1st. All right. And so long as people are trying, and this is uh, Mr. Chairman, why not? I think, Mr. That? Catania, the, the, um, Mr. Graham has succeeded in uh, conflating the issues okay. here. Uh, there's one issue, which is that under the law, under the law, after five years of being on TANF, uh, with certain specific exceptions, a person loses TANF benefits. And rather than enforce that law, we have continually postponed it. That's one issue. The second issue is that Mr. Mr. Graham's amendment reduces the training budget. And the, the uh, mayor's argument with which I agree, is that if we want people to get jobs and not be on TANF, we need to help them, and we help them by, among other things, providing training. I agree, Mr. Now, Chairman. the only reason why the two issues come together is because, because the amendment before us would perpetuate for another year the benefits and pay for that by cutting the training. The training presumably could, could affect anybody who's on TANF, whether it's one year or eight years. Uh, it would affect the training. It would reduce the dollars available for training. It is contrary to what the council and the advocates have asked for in the past, which is more dollars for training. That's what the amendment does, and the amendment also perpetuates the benefits. If this was only a debate about whether to perpetuate the benefits, it would be different. It's about cutting the funding for training to perpetuate the benefits. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I understand what you're saying about training, and I, I, I appreciate and support the training budget fully funded. So the issue is whether or not there are $3 million, more or less, in this budget uh, that we can uh, allocate right, for individuals who are showing up for their training and who have expired are on expired time and whether or not there's the will of the body. That's the issue, isn't it? I believe it's 5.849 5. 5. million. Yes, Mr. Um, Councilmember Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think uh, Councilmember Catania is on the right course here, which is to say we need to separate out the source of the money from training, which is the very thing some people need to get a job. But by the same token, we should be more uh, precise about who would suffer the cutoff so that if it were provided that uh, those people who are uh, cooperative and showing up for their training and appointments or wh whatever it is they have to do, that they would not be cut, and that the people um, uh, who would continue on would be continued with money that doesn't come out of training. So if this were reshaped to to have those two aspects, I think all of us would agree to be willing to extend this. Because as you say, Mr. Catania, if the person is doing everything he or she is being asked to do and nevertheless can't get a job, then that's one thing. And also, I think we re need to take the money from a different source. Mr. Graham, I I'm, I'm surprised that you would take it from the source you've it's taken it. It's the only money I have. Mr. Chairman? If there's nothing further, I have yeah, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? Um, Mr. Graham, for two minutes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, and then Mr. Uh, we're on second well, round for you know, the, the Human Services Mr. Committee. Chairman, me down. Yes. Yeah. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, the Human Services Committee has a budget and have other agencies, but um, Council Member Che, we went to the places, one of the few places that we had the ability to take the funds. Is it ideal? No, it's not ideal. I mean, no one has supported workforce. No one has supported workforce training more than I have, but you have tens of millions of dollars in your committee. I used to chair it. I chaired it for four years. I know that budget. I've given it away. Well, you've given it You're building rec centers and, and outdoor swimming pools. You know, the fact of the matter is that the fact of the, the, fact of the matter is that if, if there was another choice for the money, I would gladly use it. The, Mr. Chairman, you have conflated the issue. It was his word. You have conflated the issue because this is decreasing the increase. This is not decreasing the budget for training. This is decreasing the increase in the budget for training for FY15. I believe there's a $10 million increase in the budget for training for FY15, and we're simply taking half of it. So I think what we've got to do is to make our current programs more effective and to also move as rapidly as possible to find ways in which we can, we can get people into jobs where it really can work. But right now, and here's the bottom line in all these numbers. Of the 6,600 families that we're going to cut by 42% on October the 1st, 470, 470 of those families have either a full-time or a part-time job for more than six months. Please keep that in mind. 470 of the 6,600, and one other number please keep in mind, that 11,000 of the people affected by this are under the age of 13. These are the innocent victims. These are the people who are not going to have shoes, they're not going to have lunches, they're not going to have things to wear. They're not, this is what we're talking about. 11,000 children under the age of 13. Why would this council cut their benefits by 42% at a time when we're so flush with cash in this city that we've got a billion dollars plus in a savings account? I mean, I just can't be part of this. This don't make no sense to me at all. I'm done. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. No. Uh, the issue here, just so Mr. members Chairman. know, is that there's several folks who would like to try to find a solution, and the solution is not easy, uh, and in part because um, the only source that Mr. Graham has considered is the training dollars. And um, the, the training does not correlate one for one with the people who would be losing their training, uh, their TANF benefits. The training dollars are training dollars. And so to try to segregate the population, or better yet, to look at the power, which is a way of extending, but this takes time to develop, and you haven't developed it, Mr. Graham. Did you hear 5.8 million? No, I do not. And you did not hear what I said, which is that if you had uh, looked at this as perhaps a power exception, although I think power already provides an exception where training is occurring. Councilmember Alexander? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I know. Chairman, I have asked for before Ms. Alexander. Council Member Graham has um, given statistics, I believe, on the number of um, TANF recipients that don't show up for training. I want to know, do you have any statistics on the TANF recipients who actually go through the training and have actually gotten jobs as a result of the training? Through the chair? 470 for six months or longer many of those with, a, with an hourly wage of under $10. But you say 470 individuals have received jobs. Of from jobs the of the 16 month plus that are subject to this cut. And would that you have For more than six months, for six months or more. So, I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out then if more people would actually um, go to the training, then they would land the jobs. So my, my um, I guess my focus would be on giving those members incentive to go through the training. Instead of worrying about their benefits being cut, can we steer more people to the training? Because my, my thing is, and, and I know your passion for this, and, and I know that a lot of the persons that we're talking about, I actually represent a lot of them. And I'm torn between continuing on the cycle 
of dependence and poverty and, you know, getting people on their feet to be self-sufficient. And it seems like the more we extend the ten of benefits, which I know I don't want anyone out on the street because we cut them off, but the more we extend it, the more we are perpetuating this problem. So I, I really appreciate your passion, but I want to see that more people get through the training to give them the opportunity. Instead of worrying about getting cut from your benefits, worry about getting the training to get a job, to move forward. And I think that's the message that we need to send. So I really am torn and about supporting um, your amendment. And for that reason, I may not be able to because I have to give the program a chance to work and people the opportunity to say, look, you can't depend on this forever, and you should take advantage of what we have available for you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry. Mr. Chairman, I haven't had a chance to I think speak. That, I, I think Chairman. that if, if, we, if we could... Uh, Mr. Barry has been recognized. Oh, Mr. Barry, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me say to Ms. Alexander, she's my colleague, my partner. We vote together most of the time. What are you going to tell those low-income people in what seven that you cut their benefits by 42 percent. What you going to tell them, Yvette? And you and I are friends. What you going to tell them? What you going to tell them? What is any of you are going to tell low-income people that that's the case? It would be different if some other cities had found a solution to this and we adopted that solution. This solution has been tried over and over again. You can't get low-income people out of poverty through punishment by cutting their meager benefits. You can't do it, Mr. Chairman. But more important, what's disturbing about this, first of all, those members who support this ought to be ashamed of themselves. In 2014, you voted in to cut 11,000 children and 6,000 family members, reduce it by 42%. Mr. Chairman, I ask you, are you willing to reduce your salary by 42%? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let me say to Ms. Shea, who asked an honest question, if you understood this population, you understand. I'm not apologizing for them. A lot of things they do, I don't condone, but I understand it. Generation after generation, they, there's no incentive. I would tell Mr. Garasso, there's no incentive to go to work because if you make over $1,200 a month, your benefits are cut off. Medicaid, other things. Why would you go to work? Unless you were insane. Why would you go to work? When there's no incentive to do so. So I urge those of you who want to vote against Mr. Graham to change your minds right here and now and to have a heart. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Man. House Member Bowser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barry. And I want to just thank everybody for their very, very thoughtful conversation. Um, about uh, this issue before us. And this is an issue that we have revisited from, from year to year um, ever since the, the cuts uh, were proposed um, several years ago. And at that time, it was a very serious conversation from representatives of, uh, of what 7 and 8, as I recall, of what are we going to do to break um, this, this cycle. Um, and now we find ourselves here some years later not having better invested or or produce effective workforce training. Uh, and we know when we look across our government, we can see multiple agencies responsible for training D.C. residents with up to $100 million every year. And we see very little benefit from connecting that job training to people with sustainable jobs. Um, it's a lot that we do in this budget to help get us there, looking at our income taxes, putting more people, more money in people's pocket, um, and always focusing on housing. But I, I, I land on this with, with Mr. Graham's um, logic, um, that if we further reduce people's benefits now um, in the face of so many people being just on the razor um, in terms of being able to afford housing or stay in housing or, or even be able to, to go out and find training and jobs. Um, 
nobody wants to continue to perpetuate this cycle. Uh, and we know that next year looms large ahead of us where these benefits would actually be reduced um, to nothing. I think that we all have to commit, and I want to thank uh, Council Member Grasso for his work with my committee um, in retooling and totally re-engineering how this government approaches workforce training so that we're actually investing in training while people are working, um, working their way to sustainable jobs. Thank you, Councilmember Bowser. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly and, uh, and then uh, move to close debate. Um, and I want to say this. this, this uh, obviously, uh, people are probably hearing a little bit of frustration in my voice. And the frustration in my voice is this. I feel as though this council has dealt with this issue every year for the last three or four years. And all we have done is to continue the benefits and not solve the problem. And the problem is to enable people who are on TANF to give them every opportunity to get training and to be able to get jobs. Now, if the answer, and I'll just say this because I heard some folks say this, is that there are no jobs. Well, you know, I don't think the answer to TANF is that we keep people on TANF for the rest of their life because uh, we have uh, not enough jobs. We have a high unemployment rate in the district. Last year, I fought very hard, and I, I fought with opposition in this council to uh, fund uh, a power extension for TANF recipients in training. Essentially what that is, as I recall, is that it, power is a provision in the TANF law. It's a, a, um, a number of specific exemptions. And by exemption, that means that a person who qualifies for that particular power exemption can continue on TANF. And one of those exemptions is training. Was any effort made to fund it in this budget? No. That would directly correlate with the issue that's here, which is, okay, people who are in training and they continue with their benefits and they don't lose their benefits. But I think that's a little too complicated. And instead, what's easy is to just continue, yet again, the TANF benefits. Um, the TANF benefits, admittedly, are not very much. I don't, you know, really, it's in everybody's best interest if people are not on TANF and certainly not for six, seven, eight, nine years. And certainly we ought to do everything we can to promote training. And that's what this debate is about, because it perpetuates the benefits and cuts training. It is wrong in so many ways. It's, the committee didn't find the dollars to fund the power benefit. All the committee wants to do is extend the benefits, and it does so at the cost of cutting training. I move to close debate. Uh, the effect of which is that if there uh, anybody who has spoken cannot speak again except for the maker of the motion. All those in favor of closing debate say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Graham, as the maker of the motion, do you want to speak one last time? Yes. I consider that to be a dilatory motion, and the reason is because there was one person who voted no, and that was you. Well, we don't know that. I voted no, Mr. Chairman. All right, we have two people who voted no. Mr. Graham, do you want to speak, or we will go to the measure? Um, the, there's so much misinformation that has been put out by you. I've got to say this, is that every one of the cuts that was established by law by this council has ultimately occurred, every single one of them, so that we have cut somebody who, a family of three, Two and a half years ago was making something like was, was receiving a TANF payment of four hundred and fifty dollars. Today it's two hundred and fifty. On October the first it'll be one hundred and fifty. Every single cut has been made. They have been delayed. They have been delayed, you're right. I and others managed to get some delays so that we could put some kind of program in order, so we could put proper assessments in place. There have been delays, but every cut has been made, Mr. Chairman. We are not restoring the full benefits today, not at all. We're maintaining the benefits at the level that they would be without the cut. That's what we're doing. And number two, we are not cutting the training budget. It's easy for you to say we're cutting the training budget. We're cutting the increase in the training budget. We're cutting the increase in the training budget for FY15. The training budget will still increase. There will still be, to my mind, and of course DHS and, and the mayor have not been forthcoming in giving us the actual budget numbers, and I'm very disappointed in this. But I believe that there's about $10 million in the training budget increased, and we're taking about half of it. 
So we're not cutting training, we're cutting the increase in training. We're not restoring benefits, we're maintaining this $250 per month. What are the people on this dais making? What is the chairman of this council making a year? I mean, it's hard to understand. You know, the, Helen Keller said, it's very difficult for people who have everything to understand the needs of people who have nothing. And we're talking about people today who have nothing. Let's be very clear about this. These are people who are dying, a dying increase in the bus cuts into their family income. And believe me, that's true. A dollar increase in food stamps really helps them. And some of us will say, oh, come on, Jim, come on, you can't be serious. Thank but you, honestly, Mr. Graham. This is the level is, of poverty. Is there anybody else? Five percent of the people Mr. who Graham, live in World War live below the federal poverty level. Mr. Graham. Twenty-five percent. I did not come here today to forget those people. Mr. Graham, people. your time has expired. Is there anybody who's not spoken who wishes to speak? Jim, I wish to speak even though I spoke. You've already this spoken. is too serious an issue. We will proceed to the vote. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Roll call, 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 Mr. Um, roll call. Mr. Cash, will you call the roll? Chairman Mendelson. No. Chairman Mendelson votes no. Councilmember Alexander. No. Councilmember Alexander votes no. Councilmember Barry. Yes. Councilmember Barry votes yes. Councilmember Bonds. No. Councilmember Bonds votes no. Councilmember Bowser. Yes. Councilmember Bowser votes yes. Councilmember Catania. Yes. Councilmember Catania votes yes. Councilmember Che. No. Councilmember Che votes no. Councilmember Evans. No. Councilmember Evans votes no. Councilmember Graham. Yes. Councilmember Graham votes yes. Councilmember Grasso. No. Councilmember Grasso votes no. Councilmember McDuffie. No. Councilmember McDuffie votes no. Councilmember Orange. Thank you voted in committee. Councilmember Orange votes yes. Councilmember Wells. Yes. Councilmember Wells votes yes. Mr. Chairman, there are six yeses and seven noes. Uh, the amendment fails. Is there anything further? We have the uh, fiscal year 2015 Budget Request Act before us as amended. Yes. All Mr. those Chairman. in favor? Mr. Of Chairman, the I would like to speak. Mr. Barry. On the budget itself. Mr. Barry. Let me say that in terms of the 15 budget, Mayor Gray did the best he could do. Much more improved over the last time. He's a big commitment for that. He put some outstanding projects in from Ward, in Ward 8. And Ms. Shea, who doesn't know anything about Ward 8, uh, decided to take $1.8 million of that money that the mayor put in, the mayor put it in, and put it somewhere else, put it to a three million, to a, a swimming pool in Ward 3, to playground Ward 3. That's not right, Mr. Chairman. We have the greatest need in Ward 8 and seven than anybody here. And so I'm ashamed of those who would be opposed to these, these persons who need to have jobs work. i tell you why they don't get jobs. Because the private sector will not have them. You go over and talk with the job developers at DHS, at DOAS. Why do you think that's the case? 70% of all the jobs in the private sector is non-DC or uh, non-DC residents. That's why they outside the barriers they got. Many of them have substance abuse and other kind of barriers and historical value. And you ask me, you ask Mr. Graham, why didn't we show up? They have no incentive to show up. And I'm not one for welfare, but for myself. I'd rather go out here and work, throw papers, do anything to make the money that I did when I grew up. But Ms. Che, you are mistaken. You have not been to one committee meeting. Mr. You, Barry, wait a minute, Mr. Mr. Barry, refrain from personal. I'm not going to remain. She's the chair out of committee. order. Well, I'm not out of order. So I'm going to continue. That that Miss J has been on the record as saying she supports Mr. cutting Barry, these benefits. Please I'm not going to stop. Right, I'm not going to stop. And you are out of order. I got three. You, you can't move me out of measure. order because I'm discussing something you don't like. I'm not doing it. The rules say I'm not you are doing not it. allowed to name members. Who said that? The rules. It, the, well, I won't name a member then. Mr. Barry, the chair of the order. committee on environment and transportation, and who now has uh, recreation under her control, has put 
all these things in War Three at our expense. So when you when you disrespect me, Mr. Barry, disrespect your me. debate is personal and it's out of order. I said, I ain't Mr. Barry, your, name. your debate is personal and it is out your of order. Your interpretation, Mr. No. Chairman. Yes, I reject my it. Interpretation. I have not called anybody's name. I'm not. So stop we will, that. We will proceed to and the vote, Mr. Barry. No, we're not going to proceed. We are because Until we I continue. Finish. You will not well, go on do it personal then. attacks. It was, are you, I'm going to have an opportunity in the in the Larry Fave session to make the same argument. And, and, and you may. You think I'm going to be tough on you because you're wrong. Mr. Mr. You have not visited Mr. Graham. the training program. Don't know Mr. Anything. Graham, I have on. a general statement on the budget, if I may. On the, yes, on please. The budget. And I think this is a very good budget. I mean, I'm very upset about the 42% cut, but there's a lot of very good things that are happening here in this budget. And there are very good things that came out of our Committee on Human Services. For example, we now have an exemption. If this passes, we now have a funded exemption for TANF mothers who have a child, who have a baby under the age of six months. They will not be subject to cuts. This is good news. This is good news. We also have, in addition to that, we have money for youth to end youth homelessness. For the first time, we have a bill, which is in the BSA, but we also have funding now to the tune of $1.3 million. It's not enough. I wish it was much more. But to end, begin to end youth homelessness in the District of Columbia. We have, we have funding for a CCNV, our largest shelter in the District of Columbia, is at CCNV. 1,300 people a night are housed there. We've had a task force meeting for six months. We now have the ability to continue that task force work with funding. We have an increase in food stamps. And there are a number of other things that could be mentioned, but you know, I, I, I have some very serious disagreements with the mayor, and I, I have one major disagreement with the chairman. But the fact of the matter, this is a good budget. Uh, I am going to vote in favor of it. I, I, I hate this cut. I hope that one of the members who voted no on the 42 percent cut voted against my amendment would please move to reconsider so that we could move this from a seven to six vote to a vote ahead so we could put this off. I think it's at a time when this city has so much money. I mean, we listen to our mayor talk about all the cranes, all the things that are happening in Shaw and Columbia Heights and H Street and 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 Skyland is finally off the ground, out of the ground. You know, all of these things that are happening that are so important, we can't forget those who are least able to represent themselves. And I just hope that somebody before the final vote on this budget who voted no against my amendment will please vote to reconsider so that we can have a turnaround of this and do the humanitarian thing on behalf of these poor families who are struggling. Because I say this, and I will conclude on this point, Mr. Chairman. We'll either pay the piper today or we'll pay the piper later on. One way or another, we're going to pay for this. Children who are going to grow up absolutely destitute are going to react in ways that none of us necessarily are going to like. And I think that's the heritage that we're building into this one part of this budget today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilmember yeah. Chay. Just uh, so I can correct the record, the claim was made that uh, uh, $1.8 million was taken from Ward 8. That was a conversion of operating dollars to capital dollars for the Ward 8 streetscape. Not a penny was taken. That's number one. And number two, in terms of the DPR capital funds budgeted by Ward, uh, the bulk of the money, largely because of redoing the therapeutic center in Ward 7 and some other major projects, the bulk of the money that came out of the committee uh, for DPR capital funding was for Ward 7 and 5. Uh, but Ward 8 is in the middle of the pack. And in fact, in the budget, as came from the mayor, but nevertheless, there is Congress Heights Recreation Center, the Douglas Community Center, Fort Griebel Recreation Center, and the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. So. I just speak now just to correct the misstatements that were made earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Wells. Councilmember Wells. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm going to speak One of the th Wells. things that, um, Mr. Chair, with your experience with the budget, you were able to find some funds that even chairs of their committees couldn't find. But I do want to note that one that does give me some concern is that the budget takes $600,000 in salary lapse 
from MPD. The concern I have is that given that the current attrition rate is 23 officers a month, well above the traditional rate of 16 per month, that taking the salary lapse means it will be extremely difficult to keep up with attrition as we move towards the retirement bubble as well. And so I, I need to state that for the record that while we you were able to get certification of a salary lapse because MPD really replaces based on attrition and we're about to hit the retirement bubble, I am concerned that um, that this is something that we may have to come back to during the year to be sure MPD is has the full funding authority to hire at the rate that they need to stay at the, the mark of 4,000. And you, you certainly could respond to that. If uh, you like. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Um, certainly, if we need to come back to this during the year, we can do that. And as we've seen, there's tremendous flexibility on the executive's part to reprogram if dollars are necessary. The, um, the reduction that was in my recommendation is to a line called additional gross pay. It's not, uh, it's not salary lapse, but it's additional gross pay. And further, in my discussions, uh, I understand that they've changed their hiring. So instead of hiring 30 every other month, which would get them to 180, they will be hiring 20 every month, which gets them to 240. So they've actually increased. In their plan, they've increased the hiring. I don't think that's a concern. And uh, the salary lapse is not salary lapse. It's a, a reduction in additional gross pay. Thank you very much for that clarification, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to close debate. There's been a motion to close debate, the effect of which is that uh, nobody can, who's spoken can speak again um, except for the maker of the motion. All those in favor of the motion to close debate say aye. aye. No. Opposed? No. Uh, the ayes have it. Uh, we have the uh, print before us. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barry, you've already spoken. Uh, we have the print before us. All right, Mr. Chairman. And Your parent, if you want to. Be a damn parrot. Mr. Barry. We well, are. A vote a was, a vote was taken a to parrot. close debate. I'm sorry about that. We have to make the same argument in the legislative session. This is a very important issue, this budget. Eleven billion dollar budget, which we just got last night or at six o'clock this morning or sometime or another. Which Mr. is ridiculous. I'm some more tell you Mr. And tell Barry you to your face. There was that a you vote act like a tyrant. There was a vote you know, to close debate. You don't and like the vote me. Was 12 and to so one. therefore, since you don't like me, you want to have use your power to no, he doesn't like Mr. Me. Barry. You know, I'm telling you, I hate to make it Barry, personal. Barry, this, this measure will be I've talked to you for forty five minutes. Three more times. I know today. I talked to you forty five minutes last night asking for peace. Let's do it this way, Phil. Let's not make a big mistake. What we have before thing. us, you members, know? is the committee I get it. as I presented know. with the amendments that were accepted in this meeting. This is the committee as a whole, so this will be back before us uh, in the legislative meeting. Uh, I move the print with leave for staff to make technical and uh, conforming changes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Do you wish to be recorded as no? Thank you. No. Uh, the ayes have it with no. Mr. Catania and Mr. Barry voting no. no. I'm sorry. Mr. Wells voted no. I'm sorry. I apologize. No. Um, Mr. Wells and Mr. Barry voting no. I move the uh, report with leave for staff to make technical uh, conforming and editorial changes. Discussion on the report. All those in favor of the report say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I'll now turn to the fiscal year. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. General Counsel, is the measure legally and technically sufficient for our consideration? Yes, it is. Madam Secretary, is the record complete? Once the report is filed. Madam Budget Director, does the measure's fiscal impact statement comply with council requirements? Yes, it does. This will be placed on the agenda for the legislative meeting immediately following this committee the whole. The next bill and final item for consideration in the committee of the whole is Bill 20-750, the Fiscal Year 2015 Budget Support Act. Uh, I will not repeat the remarks I made at the beginning. I move the, um, I move the print. Discussion? 
We have before us the uh, Budget Support Act to print with leave for staff to make technical and conforming changes. All those in favor of the Chairman. budget? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can we get a two-minute? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I have yes. an amendment. Mr. Chairman. Okay, I believe uh, we have a new lineup. Mr. Catania. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Member Che. Councilmember Barry. And Che. Yes, Councilmember Barry. What? A point of order, Mr. Chairman. Do we do we do amendments now in the committee of the whole, and then they have to be accepted as friendly, or just questions, or is this something? This is a markup in the committee of the whole. Oh, it is. Okay. And uh, therefore, amendments are in order. Well, the lineup the I have at the moment is Mr. Catania, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Barry, Councilmember Bowser. Yeah, where you been, David? Councilmember Gross. Mr. Catania. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, the first amendment I'm moving uh, is to. <laughs> is to strike subtitle J uh, regarding access RX. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong amendment. I apologize. I've got the mixed up. It's uh, this one right here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, to, it's to strike subsection J on page 69. I've discussed this with the chairman of the Committee on Health, uh, and she's uh, supportive of this uh, stripping, Mr. Chairman. Uh, long story short, the amendment as proposed would remove subtitle J and restore fully the Access RX uh, reporting requirements, uh, Mr. Chairman, to be inclusive of um, resources, advertised and marketing costs that are directed towards indiv individual physicians as well as uh, teaching institutions to make sure that what we are collecting locally is comprehensive and can be used for health, safety, and welfare issues. The chairman of the committee has expressed her support for removing the subtitle. I believe it's been circulated. Councilmember Alexander is out of the room, but uh, so let me do this. Let me say if there's no objection, it will be accepted, and you're representing that she is uh, supportive of this. I think so if there's no objection, uh, it's Mr. Catania's amendment uh, with regard to Access RX, it's Title V, Subtitle J. What's your amendment, David? I believe it was just explained. Mr. Catania, would you like to say something again? Um, sure. The, the, uh, the Subtitle J would uh, attempts to strike from the local reporting requirements those things that are reported uh, pursuant to the Affordable Care Act. And by striking this, we will continue to receive, thank you, by striking this provision, we will continue to receive the, the full cadre of information from uh, manufacturers of pharmaceuticals to us. Uh, the, the chairman of the committee and I have discussed this, and we believe that it is important for us to receive the full cadre of information and not to carve certain provisions out. We have used this information to our considerable benefit in terms of health and safety issues and prescribing practices. By virtue, for instance, of collecting this information, we're able to note the prescribing practices of some physicians, uh, and as a result, we're able to uh, we're able to uh, know when there's overutilization or overmarketing, uh, for instance, with respect to psychotropic drugs as it relates to children. In the absence of this information, we don't know this, and it's hard for us to advocate on health, safety, and welfare grounds on benefit for the benefit of our residents. And Ms. Uh, Ms. Alexander, Mr. Chairman, has come back in and she can she can co uh, collaborate or corroborate what I've said about what the Well, I think Mr. Graham is satisfied with the answer. Uh, is there, if there's no objection, Ms. Councilmember Alexander, you want to speak? Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, and, and Councilmember Catania, as he stated, we have discussed this. I didn't um, mean any ill intent by this. I just felt that um, there may be some duplicative reporting, but we have agreed that um, I accept this wholeheartedly. I support it. Uh, I don't have a problem with it, but with the Affordable Care Act, the federal requirements have, have required so many additional mandates that I just didn't want additional work to be put upon um, the executive, but it's no problem for me. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Catania. Thank you, Councilmember Alexander. If there's no objection, this amendment will be accepted. It is accepted. Mr. Chairman, I have a second amendment. Mr. Catania. Uh, the second amendment I'm moving with, Councilmember Alexander. Uh, today I'm introducing the Police Station Closure Justification Act. Uh, this uh, amendment will require the Chief of Police before closing a police station or substation to consult with the residents of the community served by the station or substation regarding community policing needs 
to release crime statistic and trends over the most recent five-year period and to release a report essentially justifying the closure of the station or substation that details why the station or substation is no longer necessary. Uh, police stations and substations serve an important purpose in our communities, uh, investigating and resolving important crime-related matters. Uh, recently, uh, Councilmember uh, Alexander and I have been in contact with our constituents in Ward 7 regarding the, the possible or the proposed closure of a police station at 2107 Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast in the 6th District. Um, we share the concerns of the neighbors and we worry about their safety, obviously, in the neighborhood. Uh, if the station were to close, uh, there would, and if there were no other substations uh, located in the immediate area, the community would suffer. And the closest main police station is located at 42nd and Benning Road, northeast, which is very far, in, uh, in fact, uh, away from the, the substation on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and we know that the 6th District has some of the most challenging uh, statistics in the city with respect to violent crimes. Uh, recently amassing in the last year 31 homicides and 691 aggravated assaults. Um, it's important that we restore the faith in the community in our uh, police officers and our willingness to stay in the community through substations uh, and the chief can assist by engaging the community in, uh, in which uh, proposed uh, decisions regarding substations and substations are to be made. Uh, there's a fiscal impact associated with it. I want to be clear, it wouldn't preclude the chief from doing what she believes is best but it would ask for consultation and to inform the community. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have the amendment, Mr. Wells. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, I'm a little concerned that this would be put into the, the Budget Support Act here. Um, I've not had a chance to review this. No one in my committee, I believe, has a chance to review this. I appreciate Mr. Catania's, Ms. Alexander's concern. I know that we do have a law that says any substantial change in, in enforcement or any substantial change from police or fire must come through the council, through a council process. I know that recently when there was a proposed change at a local firehouse, that that was the response that we had was that this should come to the council. I would be happy to have a hearing on this if Mr. Catania and Ms. Alexander would like to propose this as a bill, but putting this through here as amending the district's budget and financial plan, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a little reluctant to, to support it being there. Mr. Chair. Um, through the chair, Mr. Chair, I'm sure that this is being proposed for all good reasons, but um, I, I could ask the, um, the maker of the amendment um, about the germaneness uh, of this to the budget. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before to fire respond, would it be um, in order for Ms. Alexander to, uh, to respond as the co-maker, and then I'll be happy to, uh, to respond to Mr. Wells? Um, I don't think so. There's a lineup. Um, you spoke first, Mr. Catania, and then uh, Mr. Wells asked to speak, uh, and Ms. Alexander's on the list. I'll put her ahead of Mr. Barry. The, uh, there is, a, I think it's a legitimate question about no. germaneness. Mr. Catania, could you speak I'll to that? speak on that, too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, it is our intent to try to make sure that we have a mechanism where the community can be involved in something that is as serious as the moving of a substation, where there are a good many concerns. Candidly, the reason why I decided, along with my colleague, to go forward with the Budget Support Act is because it provided the quickest mechanism to signal uh, our support of the community's position. Uh, I'd like to hear from my co-introducer, but having said that, perhaps we can retain this for a second reading and we can talk more about it and then ultimately if there's not a comfort level by second reading, uh, then, then a freestanding measure would be in order. But again, it's just a signal to the community that's nice quite uh, nervous about this proposed closure that we won't take precipitous actions uh, involving their public safety without them at least being informed about it. Councilmember Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to continue along those lines for the germaneness of this particular um, addition and the BSA, is that currently the substation is being le leased. It's a private owner 
um, of the substation, and it will be closed at the end of this year. So that we can't control, and the community wholeheartedly supports the substation. It's been a major, major factor um, in some of the public safety concerns and security of an entire community in that area. And we are sure that that is going to close at the end of this year. So there definitely needs to be uh, effort moving forward to relocate the substation. In addition to that, we are getting a new um, police station in Ward 7, and the police chief has been, to her credit, and the executive um, in talks with the community. <laughs> so we wholeheartedly support the effort to move the station. But that substation is of urgency. And with all due respect to the chair of the committee, uh, there are some pending measures that have not had a hearing to date so that this will not impede upon, you know, the, the hearings that he already has to be scheduled, that we cannot wait. Um, we're entering recess. We, we may not have a hearing on this by the end of the year, and they are slated to close at the end of this year. So I, I, well, I think Mr. This. Wells said that he would be willing to have a hearing on it, and he would be willing to have a hearing on it soon. Um, this is really not, uh, I'm not going to rule it out of order, but it's really not germane. And my understanding from Mr. Wells is that he, this is the first he's hearing of it. I think Mr. Catania is very gracious and right in suggesting that um, he work with Mr. Wells between now and second reading on this. Um, can can we confirm a date at this time? Mr. Chairman. Or, uh, or Mr. at Mr. least for the month? Mr. Wells, did you, are you willing to have a hearing before the recess? What I'd like to do is do what you first recommended, is meet with um, Council Members Alexander and, um, and Catania and try to get to a comfort level that as we make this change, okay. that does this really, and Mr. Berry, but does, does this belong in the Budget Support Act? Um, if, if not, you know, Ms. Alexander's correct. We've got about 30 bills lined up and that we're trying to get to before the end of the the session, but um, let's talk about this. And if we have to work it in, we have to work it in. Okay, Mr. Chairman, yeah, if, you, if I might, I, I'm happy to uh, to work with Mr. Wells between first and second reading, provided it stays in. And if ultimately it's decided that the better course of action is to make it as an independent introduction, I'm happy to do that. I just want to make sure this stays on our front burner. Uh, there's no uh, no need to you know upset an apple cart here. So long as we get this done, uh, you know as timely as possible. But if possible, I'd like to keep it in while we work between first and second reading, and then I'll be the first to suggest we take it out if we're able to find an alternative approach that accomplishes what we're trying to do. Well, let's let's do this if there's no objection from members. Oh, uh, I think I'd like, like to speak, Mr. Chairman. Oh, first. You're objecting to yet? Um, what I'm typically objecting. happens with the amendment in nature of a substitute is uh, what typically happens with the Budget Support Act on second reading is that there's an amendment in nature of a substitute, and I will circulate that. Um, Mr. Catania and okay. Mr. Wells and Councilmember Alexander and Councilmember Berry will meet and discuss this. I will independently um, um, have my staff uh, check on uh, whether the executive has any issues with this. So we have at least two weeks to uh, work this out. If, if the meeting doesn't take place, uh, depending upon who doesn't meet, We'll leave it in, or we can take it out in the amendment in the nature of a substitute. So um, we'll be able to proceed with that. And if Mr. Chairman, I object. Uh, I'd like to in. speak. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Berry, I think the issue's been resolved. It's no, it has not been resolved. It's been, it's my satisfactory. Any member of this council can object. Now stop it. M Mr. Berry, the, May amendment, I speak, please? the amendment's been accepted. May I speak? The amendment has been accepted. That doesn't matter. Well, then yeah, I, to I asked to speak it. before it was accepted. I would like to speak. Mr. Chairman, you got to stop this Two kind minutes, of tactics. Mr. Berry, I think must, wait a minute. Angry. Let me finish. You're just sitting there being angry. No, I should be angry about you. Why are you angry that this is being accepted? You people pocketbooks like that, and you take care of the humane society. I should be angry. I must stay angry about that. Right, well, Jim Brown will stay angry about it. Has been accepted. Well, I know. Let me say what I... I support Mr. Catania because in Ward, even though it doesn't apply to Ward 8, we don't have one substation in Ward 8 in the 7th District. Not one in the 7th District. And you look around the city in Ward 7, in Ward 6, I don't know about Ward 5, but Ward 4, I think, 
We want three. Has one. Don't need another one. And so I wanted to point out to my colleagues that Ward 8, the 7th District, is in a similar boat in the sense that having a substation. Lisa Alexander has a substation on Pennsylvania Avenue whose lease is going to expire, and she desires that she should be uh, making sure that either it doesn't expire or whether or not to build a new one. And so I, I wanted to point out, the Chairman, you shouldn't mix up these kind of things, that we in Ward 8, 7th District, don't have a substation, and we have a need. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just talking about the 7th District. Fairlawn is in the 6th District, as you very well know. Right? All right, then. But it's in Ward 8. This district is in the 6th District. Mr. Chair, I said the 7th District. Wait a minute. At the moment, the there's nothing district. before us. And I this said discussion the 7th District. The 7th Chairman, District, Police District, does not have a, a substation. That's all. Mr. Chairman. Council Member Che is next in the lineup. Mr. Council Member Che. I'll give up my turn. Uh, Councilmember uh, Barry, did you have uh, something? Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Mr. Chairman, I, I wish to speak on the amendment. Take it later. There is no amendment before us. It was accepted. What well, is now being recognized is Mr. Barry. After him will be Councilmember Bowser. And then Shay. Okay. Did you recognize me, Mr. Chairman? All right, let me explain to members. I have a lineup here. People have asked to be recognized. I um, technically did not follow the rules in that the amendment was accepted, and then Mr. Barry spoke with regard to the amendment. Um, I am back to the lineup. Mr. Barry was next in the lineup. Councilmember Che, I guess, misspoke when she said she didn't have anything, so I will put you back in the lineup. You will speak Thank after Thank you. I Mr. thought we were on an amendment. I thought we were still on an amendment. There is so the amendment that Mr. Catania, uh, I apologize if this, if this, if I did, um, didn't make this clear. The amendment that Mr. Catania moved that was co-introduced by Councilmember Alexander was accepted. There was no objection from anybody. However, there was an agreement that Mr. Wells, Mr. Catania, Mr. Berry, Councilmember Alexander will meet between now and second reading. And depending upon how that goes, it may or may not be in what will probably be an amendment in the nature of a substitute. That having so been that amendment's said, disposed of. Can I re return to my place in the order? Yes. Okay, I, have two, I have two amendments. Uh, the first is a companion to the amendment I moved um, regarding the Budget Request Act, and specifically it would waive the public space occupancy for farmers markets. Uh, as I said earlier, the farmers markets expand access to healthy food, particularly in neighborhoods um, without grocery stores, and currently the district charges fees to locate the markets in public space, which amount annually to $41,000 and they can create a barrier for new markets or increase the cost of current markets that are operating. And the amendment would waive the occupancy fee charged to the farmers markets in order to encourage more of them to, to locate. Uh, the funding is from excess funds in the DDOT program that issues public space permits, and I hope the amendment will be accepted as friendly. Uh, the amendment is before us. If there's no objection, it will be accepted. It is accepted. Thank you. And I have one more. Uh, at the request of PEPCO, I'm moving an amendment, which I hope will also be accepted as friendly, uh, to the Budget Support Act to clarify DDOT's authority over vaults. Section 602E1 of the Budget Support Act, among other things, authorizes the mayor to close off entrances to public space vaults as it sees fit. As many vaults are used by utilities to run power, gas, and other lines underground, PEPCO has requested that we add language directing DDOT to at least consult with the utilities before closing any vaults to ensure that those being closed aren't necessary for utility purposes. Specifically, the amendment would add the following language, quote, provided that should the subject vault contain utility infrastructure, the mayor shall uh, confer with the affected utility prior to any modification to the vault about whether the planned activity would compromise the operations of the utility infrastructure system. And again, I hope that this could be accepted as friendly. Is the intent, Councilmember Che, to ensure 
notice and consultation? Yes. Uh, and no nothing further? Nothing further. Mr. Chairman? Uh, the, the reason why I asked is because I remember a half dozen years ago there was a little bit of a dust up here in the council with regard to um, utility uh, conduits um, and who had control over them. But this is just to ensure notice and consultation. Correct. DDOT will have the authority. Mr. Graham, on this? I just want to be clear that you know, some of these vaults are privately owned and privately taxed. I mean, publicly taxed. I mean, this would only apply to a situation where you had a utility that was involved or owned the vault. Is that what you're saying? No, this applies to public space vaults where utilities have infrastructure. Well, so these are vaults that are owned by the District of Columbia Correct. as distinguished from vaults that are privately owned. Correct. Okay, thank you. If there's no objection, uh, this amendment will be accepted. Uh, it's accepted. Further, Councilmember Che? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bowser? No, I'll pass, Mr. Chairman. I don't, I don't have it today. Uh, Councilmember Chairman. Grasso? Uh, thank you very much. I have a fairly simple amendment here just to uh, replace um, some language that was inadvertently left out after the committee markup. Uh, um, so basically, uh, I've been on ongoing discussions with uh, the CFO, Mr. DeWitt, regarding the need for more transparency for how agency budgets are presented to the council and the public. The current budget books, in my opinion, are nothing more than a snapshot, and there are ways for us to continue to increase transparency. This year, the CFO's staff worked diligently with the Committee on Education and the D.C. Public Schools to present an agency budget that was far more transparent than anything we've seen from DCPS since I worked in the council years ago. During the budget hearings, I challenged Mr. DeWitt to take a similar approach to the OCFO agency budget next fiscal year, and he accepted that challenge. This amendment would simply require the Office of the Chief Financial Officer to submit a report to the Council on recommendations for improving transparency for the OCFO agency budget, as well as an implementation plan for how this will be accomplished by the submission of the FY16 budget to the Council next year. We were told this amendment did not require a uh, fiscal impact because it is simply a reporting requirement. This amendment was passed by the Committee on Finance and Revenue during our markup. Uh, and unfortunately was just simply not included in this version of the Budget Support Act, so I'm hoping that it can be uh, inserted to the, at this point. Uh, Mr. Grasso, um, as you know, I uh, have worked with the council officers, the budget director, and the general counsel with regard to all the recommendations from the committees. Uh, I was just asking why this did not get into the BSA that's before us. I'm told that it's because the report said it was subject to appropriations. I don't see how that's possible here. Uh, so with the understanding that um, this does not have a cost, I have no objection to it. If it turns out it has a cost, we'll address it in the amendment nature of a substitute, which Thank might you. mean to strike it. Is, is, if there's no objection, this will be accepted. It's accepted. Further, Mr. Grasso? No, thank you. Councilmember Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have one amendment that I would like to um, introduce, and this is to address um, the provision. If this phrase could be um, could be striked to say that says, provided that two million dollars shall be made available to the teen pregnancy program. And in the appropriate um, location, I would like inserted the subtitle to be cited as the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Fund Establishment Act of 2014. And the purpose of this um, fund is for a teen pregnancy um, establishment fund that will, one, put in as the administrator only um, the campaign to prevent teen pregnancy, and they are not eligible for funding at all through the, the money that's allocated. They would only be allowed a 10% a administrative um, fee. And I believe we had in there originally that the money was there, but it would be administered through DOH. And as I explained to you earlier, this organization would have the, this organization has the expertise to know who actually 
does the job in that area. There are a lot of um, there are a lot of organizations that have done the work and have been very successful, and they would be the administrators of the allocations, but they would not be eligible to receive any of the funding. Uh, Councilman Alexander, you and I have talked about this. Uh, and my discussion with you is that uh, as it came out of the committee, the language was such it was construed as an earmark. And um, that was the conversation you and I had earlier. Uh, funding was in the uh, Budget Request Act for this to $2 million. I talked to the general counsel before, right before this meeting. I'm looking at him at the moment. I asked him if there was an issue with regard to the um, earmark rule. Yeah, they and, would not uh, be eligible for the funding. It would be competitively uh, sought out, and they would just administer um, the awards. They are not eligible to receive. The general counsel advised me earlier that this language uh, comports with our rules. So I will accept it if nobody else objects to it. If there is an issue, a uh, further issue, we will work on that with the uh, amendment in nature of a substitute. Thank you, Mr. Is there Chairman. any objection? Uh, then this is accepted. Further, Council Member Alexander? That, that's it. Thank you. Council Member Graham? Councilman McGram. Discussion? Uh, if you want, yes, uh, on the Budget Support Act. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a clarification mm -hmm. on the subject of mean streets. And I have been approached by the Georgia Avenue Business Association and others on Georgia Avenue, lower Georgia Avenue, I'm sure upper Georgia Avenue has issues in this as well, who want to see something in the Budget Support Act to support them in becoming a main street. And they refer me to actions that were taken last year and maybe again this year involving, and I don't want to be too particular, but I have to be, involving Rhode Island Avenue. And what was the other one, Councilmember Orange? It was Rhode Island Avenue, and I believe uh, there was a combination of A Streets and, and Bladensburg Road. It was kind of expanded. Okay. And, and my clarification that I'm seeking, Mr. Chairman, the clarification I'm seeking and is that would this, would this constitute an earmark? In other words, you know, I mean, and I, I want to be very clear. I mean, I, I had great earmarks when we had earmarks. What's they were the very best? successful. But I, isn't it, isn't it, haven't we, don't we now have a process whereby we forbid earmarks for a specific purpose coming out of this council? And if I were to, I just need this because I had these discussions very recently with the folks on Georgia Avenue, and afterwards I wondered, well, let's say I had the money to support a, a main street on Georgia Avenue, and I had a couple hundred thousand dollars. But wouldn't that constitute an earmark? I don't believe so. If the, uh, we have in the law uh, retail priority areas, main streets, right. and uh, we, it's not in violation of our earmark rule if we favor one main street over another main street, or if we make one street a main street and another street not a main street. Well, if we were to go further and say that we're going to uh, provide money to for facade improvement for Smith's grocers, uh, that would be an earmark. Mr. Zvenich, do you want to say more? I'd simply note that there's a misconception that earmarks are banned. That's not correct. The, there are specific rules about how earmarks can be included um, this particular thing is an earmark. Uh, it just is consistent with our rules, and they have other obligations to meet before it can be part of the Budget Support Act. And what are those, what are those requirements? Those are set, set forth in Part D of uh, the budget provision. Can you give rules. me a quick summary sure, for the sake of the public on this? Because sure. I mean, there are a number of rules that are included in the Council rules, starting on page 49 of the rules and going on, about what grantees must do in order to get a named grant. Huh. So presumably in this particular case, those, to use your term, grantees have gone through those rules? They're going to be required to in order to have uh, have this go forward on second reading. Oh, after the council acts, they will be required. But before second reading. Oh, before second reading, they'll be required to do so. Correct. So, so we, we, we haven't forbidden earmarks. No, no, no. Uh, generally, uh, generally, they're not acceptable. They're not forbidden under Generally, they're not acceptable? Correct, Mr. Graham. Do you have anything further, Mr. Graham? I have to be Well, I have a great deal further, but I, I, I don't know where you go from here. All right. Let me recognize Mr. Barry. 
general is that not acceptable? What does that mean? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just talking to Ms. Catania, chair of our committee, about it. And he has a different way of achieving the same results. Mr. Chairman, before I continue, could I ask Ms. Shea a series of questions? And that is, which is in order, why is it that during this whole budget process they, that Ms. Shea did not speak to me one time about any project, including Water Street Bridge, in Ward 8? Yet, she didn't fund one project. I suggest we do Congress Heights myself last Thursday or Friday. And why is it she would put $5 million for outdoor pool in Ward 3? M Mr. Barry, this is, this is way too close question. to personal. You can't control my, it's not personal. You, I'm asking a question. I can ask a question. Come on. We do it all the time up here. Because you don't like what I'm saying, you want me to well, stop? Well, you've spoken for a minute and you haven't asked a no, question. No, I'm asking a question. I ask a question that I, that I'll speak to the amendment. Why is it that you added seven million dollars to Hirsch Park when they've already gotten over a hundred, I mean, uh, over fifty-seven million dollars for Hirsch? Mr. Barry, why is it? I'm looking at General Counsel. This this is over the line with regard to decorum. Take, don't take my minutes from me, General Counsel. Yes, the BSA I'm asking is a before question. us. I'm asking a question. You're being very personal. This is America. I'm asking a question. This is not First Amendment. Let the, gen the general counsel speak. Rules. I want to hear and, David And our rules speak. are that the debate cannot be personal. I'm not personal. There, there, there are a couple of rules at play here. The first is related to the germaneness on the amendment. Right now, there is still an amendment before uh, the body that's narrowly related to the $2 million for teen pregnancy. I thought, I thought he so moved I, on. No, I think that's still before. Uh, or, is that true, Mr. Chairman? Is it still before us, or is it? Oh, it has been accepted. Okay, so then the, the second rule that's at play. Wait a minute. Is it before us? It's not before us. That's been accepted. As Thank you. I apologize. The, the question uh, about personalities is a different issue, though. The council rules separately have two provisions. One, they say that you can't refer to somebody by name. That's one provision. And then there's a second rule that says you can't engage in personalities. And that means that you cannot impugn the motives, you can't use indecent or profane language, or participate in conduct that disrupts or disturbs the ordinary proceedings of the body. You can debate the underlying question, question but what you cannot do is you cannot impugn the motives or suggest that there are improper... Uh, how did I impugn the motives of Ms. Shea? Tell me that. Specifically, how did I impugn her motives? I asked her a question. Why did you do this? Why didn't you meet with me? I did this. These are Straight up factual questions. Understood. Yes no. I think the, so the tell me how it, come on, David. Tell me how. Well, ordinarily what one does instead of No, asking, I didn't ask you, Mr. Chairman, I asked the general counsel. Well, as the chairman of the No, you didn't of chairman this nothing. Body, you cannot I, take I, the place of the general counsel. Right. I asked the general counsel to tell me specifically in my last round how did I impugn the motives. You may assume that. But I said nothing. I asked her a question. Why did you put five million dollars for a swimming pool outdoor? That's a factual question. And the, and the we answer do it all the time up here. The, the answer to that is twofold. One is that the chairman is actually the one that interprets the council's rules, and he's made an interpretation that the personalities haven't invoked. Um, and second, because it's contextual. You're the general counsel. Correct. Because the chairman says it so to make it so. That's, That's true. Is. And so, Mr. Barry, wait a I minute. am, I am I the one a... who decides the rules, and if you don't like my interpretation, no matter you can appeal the decision of the chair. You acted Mr. illegally. Mr. Barry, typically in debate, in debate, that's what we do on the dais, in debate, if you believe somebody didn't talk to you when they should have, you don't ask them why, you simply make the statement that they didn't. And I can't do that, it. according and to you. You didn't do it in a, per and you don't do it in a personal way. Can I, can so I, I would say, Mr. Personal, Perry, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Perry, I'm giving you an arbitrary. example. No, it's Mr. Arbitrary. Perry, I'm giving you an example. It's so arbitrary. instead of saying, why, Mr. Barry, didn't you talk to me, I would say, Mr. Barry should have talked to me. I make a statement in debate. But when you ask the question, you are asking the member to respond. You are then personalizing it. I won't I miss really don't Shane. want to prolong this Mr. any Mr. further. Mr. Chairman, you are so wrong on this, on this dais. Committed members, non-committed members, 
ask very specific questions of the chairs. No question about that. They don't. They they, they ask about this. They ask Not about in that. an accusatory way. Yeah, well, that's, your, that's your tone. That's your problem. Mr. Ain't Barry, my problem. I'm going to rule you out of order. Well, you can do what you want to do, but it's not, it's not your problem. It's your problem, not my, my problem. problem. You're three because minutes you're, over your time. No. no. Uh, is there any further time. on the uh, Budget Support Act? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry, you're not recognized. Mr. Further on the Budget Support Act. Uh, Mr. Wells. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I thought I was in the queue. Um, I have an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Moving the amendment, the Manufacturer Licensing Amendment Act of 2014. The amendment adds a Class C manufacturer's license that authorizes and regulates licensee's operation of a facility for manufacture of alcohol-infused solid foods at the establishment described in the license. Companies selling products containing alcohol have been informed that their operations do not comport to current district licensing schemes. For example, crunk cakes is a woman-owned, extremely small bakery based in Ward 6. They were supplying alcohol-infused cupcakes to taverns, particularly in the 8th Street Corridor. They received guidance they would need a manufacturing license in order to operate to their fullest potential. Our laws only contemplate larger breweries or, and distilleries in our manufacturing laws, and this would create a really harsh burden for a small bakery like this, especially the fees. The amendment strives to make the district more open and progressive by removing unnecessary hurdles for small businesses to operate. Because our existing law did not anticipate this circumstance, this amendment will resolve this concern while maintaining important safety safeguards and protocols for alcohol products. The language contained in the amendment has been vetted by the ABC board and found to be acceptable. As the availability of venues for the advancement of startups and entrepreneurs increases, it's incumbent upon government to address and update the associated rules and regulations to meet the needs to support new and emerging economies. Thank you, and I invite your support. So moved. Uh, Mr. Orange, uh, because this affects your committee. This is, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to object because this is the first I'm hearing about this. And, and to say that the ABC board has weighed in on this, the ABC board has not contacted me. I, I think this is a, a major, um, you know, game changer here to allow, you know, bakeries to start putting alcohol in food without any hearing whatsoever. Uh, I mean, what, what, are the, you know, what are the safety issues behind this? I mean, clearly... You know, this gives me an opportunity to, to restate, um, which I have before, about us using this Budget Support Act to create laws without, you know, just bypassing everybody. And, and something like this really should have a two, hearing. Two things, if I, if I may, Mr. Well, Chair. Let me suggest this. Well, well, two things. One is it's germane because it, it's a licensing fee. It's a new licensing fee. Second is, Mr. Orange, through the chair, um, great apologies to you. I had been assured by the executive that your staff had been fully informed and informed you, and that I um, certainly would not have gone forward without without you being knowledgeable of the, about this. So I've been misinformed. I was told that you your staff had been informed. This is a licensing fee, so it is germane. And um, my apologies to the, yeah, the chair of the committee. Yeah, and I accept your apology. And I was not informed. In fact, the executive doesn't really inform me of anything these days. It's like the announcement they had yesterday about spending $250,000 out of the grant fund to bring some animated studio into town. So, no, I have not been informed. Uh, is it possible that the two of you could work on this between first and second reading? We would leave it out and... Um, chair, the committee is amenable, of course. And Mr. Orange, you'll work with Mr. Wells. Uh, and he said yes. All right, so the, uh, that amendment's been withdrawn. Uh, if there's nothing further on the Bu Budget Support Act, uh, we will proceed to a vote. Are all the members present? All right, we'll give two minutes.
Mr. Chairman, Mr. Barry, has to be recognized. Mr. Chairman, I was explaining to Mr. Catania and explaining to the group that the disparate treatment in Ward 7 and 8, I have some charts, some charts to do that, shows that. It screwed out walls on that 9% on Ward 7 and 8 some percent in Ward 8. And I wanted to propose a way to bring back some parity to the situation. Mr. Tatania told me he has a way of achieving the same results and not to, uh, to offer it. But I should have been able to say that without you cutting me off about this. I should have been able to ask questions. I'm going to ask him in the legislative session. David, can I ask him in the legislative session? Yes. Yeah, okay, so I don't want to hear no stuff. Provided, mm -hmm. provided that the, provided that the, they're uh, germane to the question and that you will be. I will be okay. spe speaking specifically to the Recreation Department's budget. I'll be speaking specifically to transportation and the streetcar. I'll be speaking specifically to human services. That's simple as that. And I want Miss Miss Bowser. I think is gone. No, she hasn't. I want to thank her for her commitment to the people uh, in, the, in the vote. And so, also, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, can I ask the General Counsel a question? Now that this original am amendment has been amended, that then takes it back to the floor for a vote. And during that time, I can have my five minutes of three minutes to debate the amendment. Thank the you, amendment Mr. Perry. Is that correct? No, no, people can't see your your time has expired. Is that correct? Yes. Huh? All right, I just want to know, because when we get back to it, I don't want no stuff out of it. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Uh, we have before us the bill. Uh, the bill as amended would leave for staff to make technical and conforming changes. All those in favor of Bill 20-750 say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. On the committee report, would leave for staff to make technical conforming editorial changes. Discussion? All those in favor of the report, again, would leave for staff say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, Mr. General Counsel, is the measure legally and technically sufficient? Yes, it is. Uh, Madam Secretary, is the record complete? Once the report is filed. Uh, Madam Budget Director, does the measure's fiscal impact statement comply with the Council's requirements? Yes. Uh, this measure will be placed on the agenda for the legislative meeting immediately following this Committee of the Whole. That completes the business for this Committee of the Whole. There will probably be about a, I'd like to say, five-minute uh, shift so we can set up for the legislative meeting. <laughs> and uh, then we will begin. We have a little bit more business in the legislative meeting. Uh, we have the supplemental budget as well as, I believe, the log and the um, ceremonials. Uh, so the time is now 3.40 in the afternoon, and this meeting of the Committee of the Whole is adjourned. <laughs>